Okay, members, we are going to um, start this meeting, and uh, I now call the 2021 delegation meeting of, of our delegation to order, and I'm going to ask Carly, my uh, legislative aide, to call roll. Representative Soroy? Here. Senator Wright? Here. Chair Mayfield? Here. Vice Chair Altman? Representative Fine? Here. Representative Placencia? Uh, and Palencia, uh, Palencia is excused. Um, he called in and said he wasn't going to be able to make it. Uh, he does have Sonny here. Sonny, where did you go? Sonny's in the back. If anyone has any information to convey to Representative Palencia, please make sure that Sonny uh, receives it. And I know Representative Altman will be here, so he will, I'm sure, walk in the door any minute. Uh, we, um, uh, a quorum has been called, and this meeting will now come to order. Um, one, I want to welcome uh, everyone to the Bavard County Delegation meeting for the 2022 uh, Florida Legislative Session. Um, just as a couple of housekeeping items, and I'm going to go very quickly through these, uh, please turn off or silence all of your electronic devices. If you wish to address the delegation and not on the agenda, please com complete a public appearance card that is out uh, in the back of the room. Uh, the cards are available at the registration table and we will accommodate as many people as reasonably possible. I also ask that all speakers are courtesy of their allocated time given the interest expressed here tonight. Please pay attention to the stopwatch in the front. Um, please wrap up your speaking when the timer turns yellow and stop speaking when the timer turns red because we will ask that you stop speaking. Um, I have noticed that there are several speakers that are going to be speaking on this from the same group. If you are speaking on the same topic, consider standing and waving in support as a courtesy to all the other members that are here uh, that want to speak tonight. In the case that the Commission Chamber reaches capacity, we will be using an overflow room located in the Florida room. And as space becomes available in the chamber, my staff will advise attendees in the, in the overflow room that there is space in the chamber for them to come on in. Please be aware of the person speaking in front of you and be on deck so that we can move this meeting along quickly. In order to maintain a decor of our meeting, please refrain, refrain from cheering or clapping. And now I asked, um, um, I'd like to ask Mayor of Palm Bay, Rob Medina, to lead us in our prayer. So good afternoon, delegation. How's everybody doing today? Isn't it exciting to gather? Listen, before we get started with our prayer, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for invoking God's presence here today. And, and knowing that we do practice our foundation. This is a Judeo-Christian nation. And thank you for the opportunity of welcoming God into this very presence. Hoorah. So, wow, everyone's already standing. Praise God. We live in a great county. Well, Father God, creator of our heavens and earth, we give you thanks and praise. We glorify your name. Today, we will hear from your people, Father God. And before we do, we lift up our leaders. These leaders that you placed up in authority, Father God, we declare wisdom over them, Father God. We declare your grace and mercy follows them wherever they go, Father God, as they serve your people. Today, Father God, they will hear petitions from throughout your community, throughout each and every member of this community, Father God. Let it be placed in golden coffers as angels themselves raise them up to your glory and mercy seat, Father God. Fill these chambers with your Holy Spirit, Father God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy over the county, over the great state of Florida, and over this great nation we call the United States of America. Father God, we ask and plead for these petitions and declare them in the God of Abraham, in the God of Isaac and Jacob, and in Jesus' mighty name, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, thank you, Mayor. Now, um, I would like for the delegation, um, actually, <laughs> I would like to recognize Senator Wright to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. You will follow me with the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, now I'd like to, um, the, 
I'd like the delegation members to introduce themselves, and we're going to start to my right with uh, Representative Saroy. If you would um, introduce yourself and your uh, staff that may be here today, and what district you cover. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair Mayfield. I have um, Angelique Rinaldi and Emma Bohannon here from my office today, and I'm Tyler Saroy. Have the privilege of representing uh, Merritt Island, Cape Canaveral, Rockledge, and Coco in Port St. John in the Florida House. Thank you. Rep uh, Senator Wright. Good afternoon, everyone. Senator Tom Wright, uh, District 14. Um, enjoy being here with you tonight. I'm looking forward to all of the good work that we're going to do. Way in the back of the room, they're trying to get away, is Diane from my staff, Suds, and Chris Morris. So thank you for being here. Great. Thank you, Senator Wright and uh, Representative Altman. Um, Thad Altman, uh, uh, House District 52. Uh, basically, Melbourne Beach to South Cocoa Beach uh, on the beach side and mainland from 192 uh, up to just uh, the northern limit of Vieira. Riley Cornell, my legislative assistant, is here. She's somewhere in here. There she is, right there. And then my district secretary, Ash Ashley Holton, which I don't think Ashley's there too. And um, looking forward to hearing from our community. And those are the two you really get a hold of to help make things happen. They, and make it happen. So thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Altman. Uh, now we're going to go to Representative Fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am Randy Fine. I represent the 53rd District of the Florida House. That's basically every, everything south of Representative Altman, but everything south of 192 with the exception of Melbourne Beach, Indy Atlantic, and a little corner of downtown Melbourne. I represent all of Palm Bay, um, most of West Melbourne, a little bit of Melbourne, and then a lot of unincorporated uh, Grant Valcaria and Malabar. Um, I have with me Nancy Bernier, who is my, uh, who is my district secretary, and she's over there. You can grab her uh, if you need to get in touch with me, and I'm glad to be here today. Great. Thank you, Representative Fine. Um, and my name is Senator Debbie Mayfield. I'm also the Majority Leader for the Republican uh, Caucus in the Senate this, uh, this session and next session. Um, I represent District 17, covering all of Indian River County and most of Bavard County, of which Senator Wright um, uh, is uh, adjacent to my district. Um, I have with me today legislative aide Kelly Fairchild, who handles policy and appropriations requests, and Kelly is in the back of, uh, Kaylee is in the back of the room. Uh, we also have uh, Kelly Lane. I have all K's in my office, if you've noticed. I have Kelly Lane, who is, uh, manages our district office and does constituent work, and she's also in the back of the room helping out. Uh, and then I have my legislative aide, Carly Smith, who's to the left of me. Uh, Carly works on policy and constituent work. Uh, Carly and Kaylee will be traveling to Tallahassee with me, so if you make it up to Tallahassee, please stop by uh, and see us. We also have um, Sarah Mikowski, who is an intern working for my office this session, and she is in pre-law at the University of Central Florida. And Yvette Campbell is also a part-time district secretary who handles constituent work on our office. Our office is located in uh, the Melbourne City Hall, so please feel free to stop by and see us uh, anytime that you would uh, like to do that. Now, members, considering that um, we do have some business that we have to take care of, Representative Fine has a, another engagement he has to get to, so we wanted to make sure that we did have the election of our chair and vice chair for the 2022 Bavard delegation meeting, which would represent the 2023 legislative session. So with that, Senator Ride, it's my understanding that you have a motion. Yes, I do, Madam Chair. I re nominate Representative Altman as chair of the 2022 Brevard Delegation Meeting for the 2023 Legislative Session. Thank you. All in favor, say yay. Yay. All opposed, say nay. The yeas have it. The motion is carried. Uh, Representative Saroy, I understand that you have a motion to be made. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I nominate Senator Wright as vice chair for the 2022 Brevard Delegation Meeting for the 2023 Legislative Session. Thank you, Representative Sorori. All in favor, say yay. 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 All opposed, say nay. <laughs> A yay has it. And uh, congratulations uh, uh, to both of you. And I look forward to working with you at the next delegation meeting. Um, and so now, members, we are going to move right into the local bills. Um, as you've noticed, if you picked up agenda, and I really hope you picked up the agenda at the front desk so you can follow along, uh, Representative Fine has about three uh, local bills that he would like to um, present. So, uh, Representative Fine, with that, um, you're going to. The per first bill is an act relating to the Barefoot Bay Recreational District uh, of Bavard County. Representative Fine, you're recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, members, for hearing this bill today. Um, this is a bill that was brought to me by the Barefoot Bay Recreation District that would simply change the timing of their elections. Right now, they're on a 3-2 cycle, so three, one year, two the next year for two-year terms. Um, with six-year term limits, this would change those terms from two years to three years and set them up in a 2-2-1 two, two, um, cycle, subject to them having a referendum on the issue in Barefoot Bay. So the voters of Barefoot Bay would decide, but this would give them the ability to consider doing that if they so choose. And that is the bill. Great. Thank you, members. Uh, do you have any questions on the bill? Seeing no questions, is there any public comment cards on the bill? Okay. Members, is there any debate on the bill? Seeing no debate, members, all in favor of the bill, say yay. 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 All opposed, say nay. The yeas have it and show that bill will be reported favorably by the Bavard delegation. Next, Representative Fine has another bill, Act Relating to the Melbourne-Tillman Water Control District. Representative Fine, you're recognized to explain your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and much like the Barefoot Bay was for Barefoot Bay, which is in my district and, and yours, this is a bill that is for the Melbourne-Tillman Water District, which is also fully in my district as well as in Senator Mayfield's. This is a bill that would help them tackle some of the issues they have relating to trespass and dumping on the right-of-ways of Melbourne-Tillman. It would help them be able to access law enforcement in order to deal with those issues where people will put litter or trash or other things on these on these right of ways which end up in our waterways and I know we're all very concerned about the Indian River Lagoon and that is the bill great thank you representative fine members are there any questions on the bill seeing no questions any public comment cards no public comment cards members there any debate seeing no debate members all in favor say yay yay, yay. all opposed say nay the yeas have it show that bill will be reported favorably by the our delegation Next, we have an act relating to Bavard uh, County. Uh, Representative Fine, you're recognized to explain that bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, an elections information bill that in all non-judicial elections in Brevard County, the party of the candidate running for that office would be included on the ballot. And that is the bill. Great. Thank you. Members, any questions on the bill? Seeing no questions, any public comment cards? Seeing no comment cards, any debate members? Seeing no debate, all in favor say yay. 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 All opposed say nay. The yeas have it. Show that bill will be reported favorably by the Bavard delegation. Thank you, Representative Fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now we're going to move on into the government platform. And um, please, we, we've allowed three minutes for this section of the delegation meeting. So uh, if you would please adhere to that so we can move along. Um, you don't have to take the whole three minutes if you don't feel compelled to do so. Um, so first up, we have Captain John Murray of the Cape Canaveral Port Authority. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. Uh, on behalf of the Canaveral Port Authority, thank you for the good work that you do and your continued support of our port. I appreciate this opportunity to share the port's priorities for the upcoming legislative session. For decades, Port Canaveral has been an important economic driver for this region, delivering billions of dollars in economic prosperity to the Space Coast and Central Florida regions, as well as to our entire state. However, as you know, the global pandemic had a very profound negative impact on the port, and in the last 17 months have been very, very difficult. But I'm happy to say that we're coming back strong thanks to many months of hard work by many people. We extend our thanks to Governor DeSantis, Florida Department of Transportation Secretary Thibault, and to you and your colleagues in the legislature for supporting the governor's allocation of federal relief funding to help Port Canaveral and other Florida seaports stabilize their operating budgets. Looking to the future and in investing in our infrastructure continues to be a vitally important uh, aspect to ensure we meet our current needs and remain competitively positioned for growth. Likewise, state investments in improving roadways and bridges connecting to and from our port are critical to the growth and economic vitality of our region. We urge you to support robust funding for the Department of Transportation's fiscal year 23-24 work plan. We also ask for your continued support and advocacy for replacing State Road 401 bridges and to support the efficient completion of the long planned improvements to State Road 528. To safeguard the rapid resumption of port operations after a heavy weather event or emergency, it is also important that Port Canaveral and other Florida seaports are recognized as critical infrastructure to ensure we have efficient access to recovery funding. And to help us protect the port from physical and cyber threats, we urge the delegation to support funding for port security grants. 
And finally, we encourage you to support legislative and administrative efforts to help seaports access funding to improve our resiliency to natural disasters, sea level rise, and other vulnerabilities that threaten our operations and assets. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today. We look forward to continuing to work with you in these issues and that are very important to Port Canaveral and to our region. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, Captain Murray. Uh, members, do you have any questions? Great. Thank you. Great. You, thank you again. Uh, Senator Wright, did you have a question? Okay. Thank you. You've done a great job, and we really appreciate all your hard work that you've done. Um, as a real quick note, we've, I've just been advised that we are at our capacity in our, in, in our room. Uh, we do have uh, people that are in the overflow room that is in Section 1 um, and in Section 2. So if you're not in those two sections, if you could please maybe go to the overflow room and allow those people in here. And then when more room is allowed, we will let you know to come back in. And that way we can kind of move this, move it along pretty quickly here. Um, and I, I hate for that inconvenience, but we are streaming in the overflow room as well. So you can hear what's going on in here. Uh, next, we're going to have Brenda Frettrall with the Rockledge City Manager. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the delegation. I bring greetings from the, our mayor and the city council of the city of Rockledge. I have Dr. Sean Ferguson with us today as well in the audience. It's an honor and a privilege to be before you today. And as always, we thank you for the opportunity to be heard and to serve as an advocate for our great city. And we thank you for all the work you do, both in Tallahassee and when you're at home. As you go to Tallahassee to do your very important work, we know you're facing a lot of very challenging issues. But before you take any action, please, just a friendly reminder, please remember that our city and all the cities in Brevard County have provided all the same very important services throughout this pandemic. In fact, I would submit that we provided even more services and we were there every day for our citizens without any reduction in services. While I know you may be looking for revenue streams and or providing relief to your constituents and or businesses, please consider not doing that on the backs of the cities around the state. We have been here for our citizens steadfast in providing services. Secondly, are you a proponent of diversity? I would probably submit all of you are. And do you celebrate differences? I also would submit you all probably are. If so, then you are proponents of cities because we are very diverse and deliberately designed that way. We have 411 cities in the state of Florida and no two cities are alike. You all know this. We have urban, we have rural, we have beachside, we have metropolitan area cities. Some allow doggy dining, some don't. <laughs> some have height restrictions, some don't. So cities have a rich history and character. In fact, people move to their respective city for its diversity and character. Those are the characteristics that attract those residents. So again, as you go to Tallahassee to do your very important work, Please consider this rich diversity and the character of cities and do not apply statewide public policy that could have unintended consequences to those cities. We very much appreciate you doing what you do. Please let us what, do what we do best and that is govern locally and protect home rule. Thank you so much again. It's wonderful to see you all. Great. Thank you, Brenda, so much for coming and sharing your thoughts. Uh, next, we're going to have Mayor Paul Alfrey with the City of Melbourne and my landlord. <laughs> that doesn't mean you get more than three minutes. No, sorry. No, I won't even give myself that much time. But good afternoon, Senator Mayfield and members of the Bavard Dele uh, delegation. On behalf of the uh, city of Melbourne, I'd like to thank you all for all that you've done in our community, particularly with the support of the last several years for our septic to sewer conversion program, the O'Galley Dam replacement project, and Baffelbach construction as part of the Harbor City Treatment Train, all of which you directly benefit, uh, which we all directly benefit from the health of the Indian River Lagoon. And, and I know each one of y'all uh, personally, and you each are advocates of the Indian River Lagoon, so we're very fortunate today. As a direct result of your assistance, we will be able to move more than 63 homes in close proximity to the Indian River Lagoon off the septic service and onto the public sewer system Thereby, there, uh, thereby removing over 1,600 pounds of total nitrogen from the lagoon per year. 
Additionally, the replacement of the O'Galley Dam, which is 56 years old and serves to separate an upstream ecosystem from the downstream marine environment, mitigates the possibility of dam felling and adversely impacting the Indian River Lagoon and Indian River, uh, the estuary. Finally, the Harbor City Treatment um, Train Project, which includes the installation of two generation baffle boxes to provide water quality treatment uh, and sediment reduction for runoff entering in the Indian River Lagoon will treat approximately 131 acres of commercial and residential development that was constructed prior to the stormwater treatment regulation and significantly reduces the total nitrogen and total phosphorus entering the lagoon. Um, this project, and I'll, and I'll keep, keep my uh, comments short, um, again, um, greatly appreciate what me and my fellow council has unanimous, uh, unanimously uh, voted on. Uh, and again, um, I appreciate your support. And real quick, since I got under a minute, uh, also uh, we request support of legislating, uh, providing local government the ability to regulate designated smoking areas or smoke-free zones within public parks. Uh, support a legislation that will provide funding for homelessness programs, housing the homeless and full funding of SHIP and affordable housing programs. Support of legislation addresses PFAS in soil and groundwater and support of funding opportunities for local government cyber security enhancement and training. I know it's a mouthful in less than three minutes, but again, I greatly appreciate, appreciate each and every one of you. And on behalf of the city of Melbourne and my fellow council members and our staff, we again, we, we thank you for everything that you've done and your support of the city of Melbourne. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Alfrey. Next, we have Courtney Barker with Satellite Beach. You don't look like Courtney. I, and I know you're not Courtney. I'm not Courtney Barker. A lot of people mistake me for Courtney Barker, but she's sick, so I had to come in her place. So bear with me. I had about two hours to prepare for this. So um, I'm only going to speak on one topic, and that's PFOS and PFOA. And most of you have met with me on these topics before. So I just wanted to give a brief, brief history on it is a firefighting foam typically used to put out large high temperature fires and it was used in mass for DOD sites and all over the world. And in 2018, uh, the DOD came out with a report of um, emerging chemicals of concern and PFAS and PFOA happened to be on that particular report. And our local Patrick Face Space Force, I can Patrick, Patrick Base <laughs> um, was number three for the contaminations, which brought large concerns from the community. Um, and as an elected official during that time, it was it was very difficult to know how to address those concerns because it is not a regulated chemical at this time. Um, currently, Florida uses the standards of F the EPA at the federal level. Um, but again, it's also not regulated. There is no actual cleanup standard. It is just sort of a, hey, this is what we think you should let it at, but we're not gonna fund it and we're not funding any research on it. So what we would like to ask you from the city perspective is that you pass legislation that funds not only the cleanup for this chemical, but funds research, which we need more of it. it it's evident that we don't know the long-term effects of this chemical. Um, we speak of the lagoon and the health of the lagoon, um, that big 4.2 million parts per trillion that's sitting at Patrick, do you know where that's going? It's going in the lagoon. And it's also moving into the food chain. We also don't know how it's going to affect the food chain. So we would like to see you guys put some focus on figuring out how we can deal with this chemical. Um, currently, there aren't very good cleanup technologies out there for it. They basically dig it up and put it somewhere else, either incinerate it or they put it in a lined landfill, which ultimately, ultimately just kicks the can down the road for the next generation when that landfill fails. Um, incineration techniques, you know, they have their own other concerns because then it could go into the air and um, there's also only about four of them in the country. So um, if you guys could please focus on that, um, I'm glad that it's finally after three years of fighting for this uh, chemical to be recognized. It is starting to become uh, important to local, the state, local and federal agencies. And um, thank you guys for everything you do. I know it's a hard job and I know we beat you guys up sometimes. And so, um, you know, we appreciate all of you very much. And oh, home rule, it's a big thing. Couldn't help it. Chair, Thank you. I have a question. Yes, Representative uh, Shawori. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Mayfield. And I, I appreciate your, your testimony, and I've spent some time. Uh, Stell Bailey has given me quite an education on this subject. I'm curious, though, I, the way that I understand the problem, it's going to take a lot more resources 
the mm -hmm. state can bring to bear. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you aware at this point of any, any federal interest in, in getting involved in this? So we, we've met with Bill Posey on several occasions. Um, we've talked with them on trying to put some funding um, into doing some research um, into figuring out how to deal with this chemical and, and bringing some focus. We've been to D.C. at least two or three times speaking with him and uh, Marco Rubio's people and Rick Scott's people. And so it's definitely on their radar. Um, we were hoping for an earmark this year for some funding to come down from the federal level. But the reality is, is that there's many states that have done this on their own, still kind of test for this. Um, they've set their own standards. And if you don't have a standard, it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is the big battle that we had. We had local people saying, what do we do? There's this chemical in here. And us as a city, what do we what do we do? There's no regulation. There's no way to clean it up. We have no jurisdiction to say DOD clean your mess up because the DOD is still going. Hmm, you know, we don't. We've met with the secretary of um, the military. Came down to, were you, oh no, were you there? No, Posey was there. Um, you know, when we talked about cleanup, and they don't have any money either. So it, I think the push needs to come from downhill to uphill and. It just needs to be done all around. And there is funding you guys can do for research. I know the University of Florida and Fight for Zero are currently right now doing a lot of studies, and we support all of that work. And we'd like to see that done in more water bodies so that we understand what it's doing to us, because every one of us has this in our blood right now. I, if we all got tested and we don't know what the long-term effects are. So any money, any, right. would be good. Representative Altman. Well, thank you for, for uh uh, bringing this to our attention. You know, I sit on the Military Affairs Defense uh, Task Force. Okay, good. And uh, it's a representation of uh, the entire state, and we are, we are advocates for active duty military on our bases. <clears throat> and this has come up a number of times before the Mil Military Defense Support Task Force. We are not alone. Just about mm -hmm. every base, which are many in Florida, have the same problem, and, yeah. and we've asked the same question. So, um, so we should have a lot of support across the state as we move forward and address this. You don't know by chance who number one and number two is, do you? We're number three, you said? Um, do you remember still? Um, I, I, I can't remember. But they, they've already had. So they're, the difference between what happens with them and what's happening with us is their direct, direct, drinking water was directly affected yeah. by the contamination. It's not affecting ours. And so that's why we keep falling, well, supposedly not affecting ours, because um, it actually isn't. We don't drink out of the lagoon, and it, it's not affecting that directly. But um, one thing that you guys could consider is you know, dealing with the landfills. Um, you, could, you could pass legislation talking about how you dispose of the product and, and dispose of it's in rugs, it's in <laughs> pizza boxes, it's in a lot of different items and you could go through and address those and say those have to be disposed of in a hazmat type landfill as opposed to that would be a very simple thing that you could do um, that wouldn't cost a lot of money because they're, they're around, so. Great, thank you. I see Senator Wright over there making notes on this, so I'm sure he's gonna be looking looking into this. Thank you. So, thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next we have Mayor Scott Nickled with the City of Indian Harbor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Bard County Legislative Delegation. I'm Mayor Scott Nickel, and I'm pleased to highlight two of the items in the Indian Harbor Beach 2022 legislative priorities that are included in your agenda packet. Uh, first one is short-term rentals. We accept that short-term rentals are part of the shared economy and play an important role uh, in providing accommodations to visitors of, visitors of Florida. In 2014, the legislature recognized that with stakeholder and public input, there was a valid need for local governments to adopt health, safety, and registration regulations for short-term rentals. Indian Harbor Beach has adopted reasonable health and safety regulations specific to our community. Florida cities are remarkably diverse, and the solutions to their local issues are not one-size-fits-all. We support raising safety standards statewide, but locals should retain authority to address local issues. We support legislation clarifying that existing grandfathered municipal short-term rental ordinances can be amended without penalty. We oppose the legislation that preempts municipal authority as it relates to the regulation of short-term rental properties. There continues to be ex exponential growth in short-term rentals in Florida. Clearly, this demonstrates that local regulation is not an issue. We believe preempting local health, safety, and registration is bad public policy. Please do not undo all the work that cities like Indian Harbor Beach and other communities have accomplished since 2014. Governor Ron DeSantis agrees this is a local issue. 
The second item is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, smoking in parks. Uh, Paul Alfrey spoke on this just a few minutes ago briefly, but I'll go, I'll take it a little bit farther. Florida statutes provide that regulation of smoking is preempted to the state of Florida. However, the youth of communities throughout the state currently play on public playgrounds, athletic fields, beach parks, and recreation facilities. Oftentimes, they are, play, they are, uh, they are inconsiderate adults that are smoking very, in very close proximity to these children, uh, subjecting them to unhealthy secondhand smoke. Thank you to Representative Randy Fine for sponsoring House Bill 105 and Senator Joe Gruders for sponsoring Senate Bill 224, proposing that counties and municipalities may provide smoke-free zones or designated smoking areas in a public park. We also want to thank Representative Thad Altman for co-sponsoring House Bill 105 and encouraging, and encouraging the members of the Brevard County Legislative Delegation to co-sponsor these bills in their respective chambers. As always, Indian Harbor Beach is here to assist you through the throughout the 2022 legislative session. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next, we have Britta Kellner. Hey, long time no see. All right. <laughs> Can't get rid of me. Good afternoon, all members of our legislative delegation. Britta Kellner, I'm Special Projects Manager of Legislation with the City of Palm Bay. I am not quite there where Suzanne is yet. Um, with me today was our mayor, uh, Rob Medina, Councilman Foster and Felix, and our Deputy City Manager, Joan Yonkala Brown. Thanks to all of you for your support during the 21-22 legislative session, and in particular, Representative Fine, Senator Mayfield, for fielding and pushing forward those baffle boxes along the Turkey Creek. We are all, I know, dedicated to restoring the Indian River Lagoon, and we appreciate that. The City of Palm Bay is asking the delegation for two funding appropriations and one legislative policy change. The Indian River Lagoon Water Quality Restoration Project, uh, the city is seeking funding support for the construction of five baffle boxes in locations within the Turkey Creek Basin as identified in 2017 study, two of which have a direct impact on the Indian River Lagoon, and the remaining three are near the Turkey Creek tributary. Four of the sites are shovel ready, and the fifth is, require, is requiring design and engineering for which the city will contribute $300,000 to uh, produce. Palm Bay Fire Rescue, the city is seeking support for construction of the new Palm Bay Fire Station 7, which is located at the city's former site of Fire Station 1, which is currently slated for demolition. The city submitted an application for, fund for funding on their HUD CDBG mitigation grant program in the amount of $4 million. Palm Bay City Council recently approved a little over 358000 to serve as matching funds for this grant application. The city is seeking state legislative funding appropriation in the amount of $400,000 towards the construction of Fire Station 7, which is intended to provide additional capacity when responding to incidents which are also currently activating a state response, such as wildfire, chemical incidents, and moderate to severe weather events. To underscore the significance of a major weather event affecting the city, a storm surge from a Cat 5 hurricane would impact over 100,000 of Palm Bay's residents. Palm Bay residents and business are also uniquely vulnerable to wildfire impact due to the extent of urban interface, as the majority of Palm Bay is undeveloped land and more prone to brush fires. Future Fire Station 7 will be equipped with a hazardous material unit to provide strategic response to any chemical or industrial incident. Our third request is a policy item regarding the Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act, or better known as CCNA. The city is working with the Florida League of Cities to advocate for legislative changes to Florida Statutes Chapter 287.055, amending the Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act in a manner that would allow for agencies to undertake a best value procurement process. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you, Greta. Okay, next we're gonna move to Mayor, uh, or to Mayor Pro Tem, Angela Raymond. Welcome, Angela. Thank you for coming today to give us an opportunity to voice our concerns. My topic is elections for municipal officials. These elections are conducted in accordance with locally voted upon municipal charters, with each charter unique to a particular city and passed with voter approval. Municipal representatives are elected for the duration of his or her term 
of office as specified in local charters. The Space Coast League of Cities, as well as the City of Cape Canaveral, opposes any legislation that restricts home rule authority to set municipal elections and the terms of office in accordance with the municipal charter voted upon and approved by the voters of the city, town, or village. For example, in the section headed City Elections in the City of Cape Canaveral's Municipal Charter, the regular municipal elections shall be held each year on the first Tuesday following the first Monday in November in accordance with the procedures of Florida law. All city elections shall be nonpartisan. In a following section entitled Methods of Electing Council Members, terms for elected officials shall be staggered, commencing with the general election of 2011, two council member seats shall be placed on the ballot for election. The mayor shall be placed on the ballot for election in the next year, and two council member seats in the next year. This shall be a continuous three-year rotation. During council member elections years, the two persons receiving the greatest number of votes shall be declared, declared the winners. During the mayoral elections, the person with the greatest number of votes shall be declared the winner. According to this method, the city council will have some experienced and inexperienced members. This year, however, we have a little different scenario in the city of Cape Canaveral. We had two council members resign their seats in order to become candidates for the mayor, since our current mayor has served two consecutive three-year terms. Therefore, we are having an election for a new mayor and two council members to fulfill the remaining terms of those who resigned. We are proud of the great interest among our residents, and we have four mayoral candidates and five council member candidates. Our city council is composed of five members, the mayor and four council members. The Space Coast League of Cities and the City of Cape Canaveral, can I give my Real last quick. sentence? Real quick. Supports home rule authority, and it is a cherished concept approved by an overwhelming majority of Florida rest citizens. Local governments know what's best for their individual communities and should continue to exercise their rights to do so, especially with the rising costs of municipal elections. We appreciate your listening to our concerns. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Angela. Next, we are going to have Mayor Ben Malek at the city of beautiful city of Cocoa Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the delegation. Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I certainly can empathize. Uh, well, the city of Cocoa Beach supports legislative action to address growing concerns about PFAS in soil and groundwater that impact the sewer system numbers as a result of treatment of wastewater coming from Patrick Space Force Base. Um, we have actual data because we actually do treat uh, the sewage coming out of Patrick Space Force Base. We're happy to share that with you. Uh, we have also talked to Congressman Posey's office um, and to piggyback from my colleague in Satellite Beach. So we continue to test uh, the highest concentrations are coming from uh, where the sewer system is uh, serviced at Patrick Space Force Base. I mean, those are the real, real numbers. Areas that we would like addressed include the establishment of science-based maximum containment levels, public education, risk assessment guidelines, liability protection for entities that cooperate in good faith with regulatory agencies for assessment and remediation, who have legally used PFAS for fire suppression or have actively uh, received PFAS through soil and groundwater migration, and the development of cost-effective risk-based correction strategies. Uh, it's clearly something that our residents are very concerned about. And second is, uh, piggyback off a recurring theme, the increase in uh, vacation rentals for non-traditional zoned areas, i.e. single family homes, has become increasingly problematic, uh, including uh, parking, trash, and noise issues in our community. It, it's certainly impacting the quality of life for longtime residents and neighborhoods, and actually leading to the degradation of neighborhoods. 
Um, I have the fortune of having two immediate neighbors that are now vacation rentals. So I get a new neighbor every weekend. So far it's been okay, but at what point do we continue to lose our neighborhoods? Um, there are currently 1,104 vacation rentals in Cocoa Beach, and it's continuing to grow and change the character of our community. Representative Mike Greco has introduced legislation for the 22 session to return regulatory control of vacation rentals back to local government where it belongs. We ask that the delegation supports this legislation that will bring back control to the county of our cities. And we get that uh, people have property rights and we just think there's a, a place for it. Uh, certainly closer to commercial areas where there's a lot of transient activity and uh, visitors. Single family neighborhoods should really be single family neighborhoods. Thank you again for all you do and God bless America. Thank you, Ben. And, and I also would like to recognize Patrick with Congressman Posey's office. I know I saw him in here earlier, so I know, oh, there you are. Um, anyone that has any additional information for Congressman Posey, I, I would encourage you to give it to Patrick. That's uh, one of the reasons that Patrick attends these delegation meetings to keep Congressman Posey involved in what's happening in his district too. So Great. Um, please thank, thank you guys for speaking on that and um, make sure Patrick gets your information as will well. Do. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Scott Morgan, uh, City of uh, West Melbourne. Hey Scott. Thank you, Chair Mayf Mayfield and members of the Brevard delegation. Uh, my name's Scott Morgan, I'm the City Manager for the City of West Melbourne. And in, with me here today, the West Melbourne delegation, we have uh, Council Member Andrea Young, uh, Council Member Pat Bentley, uh, Council Member Daniel McDowell, and our new Assistant City Manager, uh, Tim Rohde. Uh, he's been with the city two weeks now. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo um, what uh, Mayor Alfrey and uh, Mayor Nichols said in thanking Representative Fine for sponsoring the bill that would allow uh, local governments to have some regulation of smoking in certain areas of, of municipal parks. Uh, our mayor, uh, Hal Rose, has supported that for many years, and we sure appreciate you uh, standing tall and, and doing that on our behalf. And, and uh, so we wanted to uh, thank you for that. Uh, West Melbourne has a specific request for uh, consideration of a legislative line item appropriation. Uh, we have a neighborhood, a large neighborhood of uh, over 500 homes, over 1,300 people that has experienced flooding periodically, and we have a fairly cost-effective way of reducing that flood risk. It's a request for $460,000 uh, that would uh, allow us to take advantage of a uh, under-capacity Melbourne-Tillman Canal, divert some of that neighborhood water there, and remove it from an over-capacity Melbourne-Tillman Canal so it benefits uh, not only that neighborhood directly, but also everybody downstream on the C69 Canal. So we think it's a very, efficient project, which we would do on our own with our own local money, but for after Hurricane Irma, we did four projects with local money. We spent all of our fund and then some. It still has a negative fund balance of $150,000. So we're asking for some help uh, from the state for this uh, flood risk reduction project, which we think would uh, be very well supported in that neighborhood and, and throughout West Melbourne and into Palm Bay. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Scott. Uh, next, we have the Vice Mayor of Satellite Beach, Dominique. You. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I want to go on record in saying the person who spoke for Courtney Barker, our city manager, was actually Councilwoman Mindy Gibson. So I just want to do that on the record. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, all of you know me. I've been around since 2002. Um, and you guys do a great job. And I appreciate the time that you spend with me when I'm up in Tallahassee. Um, I'm here representing the 411 cities of the state of Florida with the Florida League of Cities. Um, Carly was good enough to put the priorities in your packet. You have them in front of you, so I'm not gonna waste your time going over them. But what I do wanna talk to you about are unintended consequences. And you know, when things happen in Tallahassee that normally get handled at the local level, it becomes difficult for cities to react when our residents call. And a prime example of that is the short-term rental bill. In 2011, when what was done in 2011, here we are going into a session 11 years later trying to address short-term rentals. Um, last year, you, pace, you passed a home-based business bill. We don't know what the effects of that are gonna be, but I can tell you this, 
I ran my business out of my house in Satellite Beach for 36 years. Most cities have home-based business within their ordinances, and they're very comprehensive ordinances that deal with, as other people have said, the neighborhoods that people are running their businesses out of. So I can tell you that we're probably going to see repercussions from the home-based business bill, and we just don't know what they are yet. Um, three, four years ago, you guys passed you know, the 5G network bill. Um, that's going to probably be something that we're going to look at as cities have to deal with the infrastructure that's going in and right of ways and on city property that if we do a stormwater project or a road project or any kind of wastewater project, the way the bill is written, the cities have to pay to move the equipment that was put there by the cell phone companies. You know, residents don't understand these things. They don't know this stuff, and they call me, whether it's with the home-based business bill when that happens or when somebody, something gets put up in their backyard that they don't like. So I pass it on to you, and you guys have already heard from people on short-term rentals. So we're just looking at we want to, as cities, work with you through the league, through the Space Coast League, that when things are happening, please let us help you and help our residents by us working together to make sure that what we end up with is something that's livable for our communities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And uh, I think that was very well put that there are unintended consequences that we do not know at the time. And uh, I think you may see some adjustments to some of those bills uh, that was passed last year because of, because of that. And the vacation rental bill, I have you know been very active in that I probably I don't know, five or six years, just like the smoking in the park. Uh, and so I, you may see some more legislation that I think you guys may be able to live with uh, this session to kind of solve that issue. Okay, next we have Councilwoman Adrienne Young with uh, West Melbourne, but she's actually representing the president of the Space Coast League of Cities. Welcome, Adrienne. Thank you. Thank you very much for hearing me today, and thank you um, for this opportunity. I will be brief, I promise. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of you who do for the hard work that you do up in Tallahassee. I would like to tell you that the Space Coast League of Cities encourages the state government to provide resources and financial support to protect areas from flooding and wind damage related to increasing weather related related issues. We support funding for programs to protect the safety, health, and welfare of residents from flooding, hurricane, wind surge, and destruction, including state funding for local government flood risk reduction projects as it relates to aging transportation infrastructure where failures threaten both traffic circulation and private and public flood damage. Lastly, the Space Coast League of Cities supports legislation that protects general revenues collected from the communications service tax, the CST tax, and the local business tax where providing for enhanced stability and reliability for these important revenue sources for cities. CST revenues are used to provide essential municipal services such as public safety plus construction and maintenance of roads, bridges, and public parks and open spaces. Thank you very much for hearing me, and I'll, I'll yield back my time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, next, um, we do have added uh, Commissioner John Tobia. There was a little bit of a mix-up on his uh, <coughs> thing submitted. So if, oh, there he is. I didn't recognize you. First, uh, I think two things are going through your head. Number one, uh, why am I wearing this wolf T-shirt? And more importantly, how do I get myself one of these wolf T-shirts? Uh, I don't think that was in my mind, but go ahead. I'm going to answer bandana. one of the questions, not, not, not the second one. I'm, on, I'm on behalf of the Brevard County Commissions. So they've given me a limited uh, script to work by. Uh, but I'm also here as the number one issue by a vote of four to one uh, for the Brevard Zoo Aquarium uh, Project, the East Coast Zoological Society, hence uh, the wolf here. Uh, the, this project... We're asking for $950,000 to help with the initial site work. The Brevard TDO has already committed $10 million to this project, and private donations uh, have added uh, about $20 million. Now, this may be the first time you are hearing uh, about this. Um, let me know if you have any questions at the end, but please don't tuna me out. Mull it over for a bit. <laughs> I feel in my soul this is important. 
And if you disagree with me, just vote for, for the halibut. <laughs> That's as straight of a face that I could argue for $10 million or $950 or $5 for a, uh, an aquarium. I won't tell you who the one vote is, but uh, it was this guy. Uh, but I, I am up here to thank you guys very much. It was your leadership that brought down $1 million uh, for the EOC. Uh, we desperately needed that. We had one of the oldest EOCs in the state, and through your guys' hard work and, and dedication, uh, you did a very, very uh, good thing that brought us over the hump for that. So on all seriousness, I, yes, we actually are asking this money for the aquarium, but you guys sincerely came through on the EOC. And on behalf of the county commission and all its residents, uh, I really appreciate your hard work. I know how hard it was in those times, and you, you guys really you hit it out of the park. So thank you guys so much. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, yes, uh, Representative Saroy. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Mayfield. Commissioner, I think it's important for you to know on that EOC project, there were no nays. Oh, really? One, one. Thank you. And um, as, a, as a comment on that, um, Commissioner Tobai, I, I think we funded that the last three years to get the money in there to do it that I sponsored. And, and it was very needed for our community. So uh, thank you guys for keeping that on the agenda uh, very much. Uh, one other comment I'd like to make is the fact that we did fund money last year, about 500000 for the aquarium. Uh, to start with the planning of it, and uh, so uh, uh, we'll have to look forward to the um, the additional money if it's if it's available. Um, I'd also like to make another comment real quick. You know, in 2020, we passed Senate Bill 712, which set up the framework for grant programs for wastewater treatment facilities, advanced wastewater treatment facilities for septic to sewer, for stormwater runoff, and so there is money. I think we did 114. It was 114 million that we have put within those grant programs, and Indian River Lagoon has got 53 million of that money that was just awarded out. I would encourage every county, every city, that before you ask for a local funding request, I would suggest that you look at the grant programs on the programs that you are asking for local funding requests um, to make sure that you that you uh, would qualify for that grant money. That was the whole purpose of sitting up. Senate Bill 712 was for the foundation um, uh, to improve the Indian River Lagoon uh, and the grant monies uh, to be put aside in order to do that. Uh, so you may find it easier to apply for grant monies than it is to, buy, to apply for local projects um, in the future. So with that, we are going to move into the government organizations. And uh, so first up, we are going to have, well, I had Ron, I had, um, uh, Debella, but I guess Debella, uh, Mr. Debella didn't wasn't able to make it. So Tom, you're uh, filling in for him. Yes. Thank you, Chair Mayfield and members of the Brevard delegation. Uh, my name is Todd Romberger, Senior Vice President of the Spaceports Business Unit at Space Florida. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. My boss, Frank Debello, sends his apologies for not being here today as he's speaking at the Enterprise Florida Board Meeting in Sarasota. Sharon Spratt, our legislative affairs lead, who you also know, is out on leave after having surgery, so unfortunately you're stuck with me. I'd like to open by thanking the members of this community that have been invaluable in supporting Space Florida's work to grow and diversify the aerospace industry in the state and right here on the Space Coast, including the EDC, FDOT, Space Coast TPO, U.S. Space Force, NASA Kennedy Space Center, and most importantly, I'd like to personally thank each of you for the commitment you have long demonstrated to assuring that Florida is the best place in the world for aerospace business to thrive. Our request this year is the same as, as it has been for the past 10 years. Space Florida has maintained a budget request of $12.5 million for business development and operations and $6 million for aerospace financing fund. Included in the $12.5 million is $1 million for the research and development MOU with Israel. These dollars, along with revenue generated by spaceport operations, have allowed us to continue to strengthen Florida's aerospace industry statewide. As an example of the fruits of your labor in supporting Space Florida, on Monday, as many of you know, Governor DeSantis and Space Florida announced that the company Terran Orbital will invest $300 million in Brevard County to construct the world's largest satellite manufacturing facility. This project will be located at the launch and landing facility, the former shuttle landing facility, at the Kennedy Space Center. Terran Orbital is expected to bring 2,100 high-paying, high-tech jobs 
uh, to our community by 2025. This project and others like it, which are currently in the pipeline, would not be possible without the strong support of the legislature. We are looking forward to working with you this session and continuing to maintain Florida and Brevard County as a top tier destination for the aerospace industry. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I am actually gonna move around the agenda because I really would like to go to tab 15 and hear from Tom Engler with the Kennedy Space Center. So it kind of falls right in line behind uh, Space Florida because I know you guys work very, very closely together. We do, thank you, Senator Mayfield and the Brevard County delegation. On behalf of Janet Petro, I appreciate the opportunity to come to speak to you about uh, what's happening at Kennedy Space Center. And as you all well know, Kennedy Space Center has had a very busy 2021 already, with the remainder of the year looking just as busy. We've had a regular cadence of launches to low Earth orbit, and we'll be launching our third crewed operational flight to the International Space Station through our commercial crew program this fall. And that is currently planned for the end of October. We're launching satellites and robotic missions on journeys to learn more about our home planet and the secrets of the universe through our launch services program. The Lucy mission is scheduled to launch mid-October and will be the first mission to study the Trojan asteroids around Jupiter. Our exploration ground systems team is working hard to get Artemis 1 ready for its maiden flight early next year, which will be a huge milestone for this center, as we prepare to return to the moon with the first woman and first person of color as part of the crew. All parts of Artemis 1 are at Kennedy Space Center, and the Orion capsule is scheduled to be stacked with the core stage next month, which will be a literal crowning achievement for that program uh, just prior to launch. So uh, to that end, we're very proud of the partnerships that we have developed at Kennedy Space Center. And a lot of that has been in conjunction with and support by the state of Florida. Kennedy Space Center has been a leader in the agency trans in transitioning to a multi-user sp spaceport, uh, partnering with the commercial industries, academic institutions, and government agencies like the Space Force, uh, Department of Transportation, Florida Department of Transportation, NOAA, uh, State of Florida and, and Space Florida, Blue Origin and Boeing. We have over 90 partnerships with 250 partnerships agreements. And I especially want to highlight our recent partnership with the Florida Department of Transportation and Space Florida and the State of Florida in helping us in secure the infra grant to replace the Indian River Bridge. Again, that was a significant enabler for commercial space here and could not have done that without the support of you all in the State of Florida. So thank you very much and appreciate your time. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you for all you guys do out there. That is a huge, a huge accomplishment on what you guys have thank done. You. Again, couldn't, couldn't have done without the partnerships uh, with the state of Florida. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna go back members to tab 14 and we're gonna hear from uh, uh, school board chairman, Misty Belford. Misty. Good afternoon. On behalf of, of the Brevard County School Board and the entire district, we would like to thank you for the collaborative relationships between our district and our local delegation. Your willingness to work with us in building stronger schools and a stronger community is greatly appreciated. We also want to thank you for your support of important early childhood education initiatives in the previous session, as well as recognition of the hard work of educators throughout the state during the pandemic. And of course, for your support of allocations to support expansion of career and technical education opportunities for our students. In the upcoming legislative session, we would appreciate your support on five issues of priority concern for our district. Inclusion of pre-kindergarten teachers and K-12 teacher requirements, incentives, and benefits to encourage highly qualified early childhood educators to commit supporting our youngest learners, thereby laying a stronger foundation for educational success. These teachers are currently not eligible for federal loan forgiveness, full drop retirement benefits, or pay incentives allowed K through 12 teachers. The expansion of the statutory definition of classroom teachers to include vital educators <clears throat> that impact student success on a daily basis. Exclusion of these instructional personnel in the statutory definition dis disincentivizes the positions that often provide additional supports that help our most vulnerable students to be successful. Assistance with addressing wage compression issues as a result of minimum wage changes and increases in teacher starting salary. Continuation and expansion of resources to support recruitment and retention of district social workers and access to mental health supports for students. And finally, support of our proposed firefighter academies to provide additional career opportunities for our students and workforce support in our community for a vital service. We look forward to the opportunity to discuss each of these in more detail with you in the near future. Additionally, it is our hope that as you enter this legislative session, you will utilize us 
as a resource and sounding board for issues involving education that come before you. We stand ready to support you in any way we can. Thanks for your service to the community. Great. Thank you, Misty. I think uh, Representative Saroy has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, more of a, a comment, and I see your uh, colleague, uh, school board member uh, Jenkins, in the back. But I, I think one of the one of the things that is kind of an unsung success of Brevard Public Schools is the trail that you all have blazed in vocational and technical training, and I and that's such a wonderful thing for our students because, as we know, uh, the reality is that not every student is cut out for college, not every family is prepared for the expense. So when I look at what BPS has achieved in terms of offering uh, construction, a construction program, teaching kids how to put build roofs uh, and do electrical work and plumbing. You have the welding program at Astronaut High School. Uh, you have an automotive program, I think, at Coco High School. You know, the EMT Fire uh, Academy is going to be a great addition to give kids that are ready to enter the workforce when they graduate high school means to do that. And then finally, a program near and dear to my heart, the culinary program. Uh, is a great is another great asset uh, for Brevard Public Schools. So I just want to thank you for what you're doing in that regard. Uh, I'm excited to see what the future holds for vocational and technical training, and uh, I'm on board for the EMT firefighter program. I look forward to working with uh, I think Senator Wright and Senator Mayfield on getting that done. Thank you, Representative Soroy, and, I, and you know I, I mentioned in, in my appreciation in the beginning, but we truly could not have done it without the support of you all um, in helping us to get some of the critical funding to make those programs possible. So we appreciate your support and look forward to continuing the expansion. Great, thank you. I have a question. Representative Fine, do you have any questions of the school board? No, I just want to know when they're going to start following the law. That uh, actually, that was um, okay. No clapping. No clapping. Um, that was actually the question, uh, Missy, I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think we have supported the school board. I think Governor DeSantis has done record funding for the uh, education for the teachers. Um, as Representative um, Sapori just indicated, we've been doing funding for these technical trainings for these high school classes. Um, the one thing that I would ask that you guys look back at is you, um, one, is parents' choice when it comes to the mass mandate. The second thing is that the Board of Education, who the school board members, our role is to make sure they follow, as Representative Fine said, the law of what the Board of Education um, and, the, and the, uh, the Board of Education has put out. Um, the Department of Education, the Department of Health came together, they came up with a, a rule, and that rule went to the Board of Education the Board of Education passed it where parents have a choice on whether their child wears a mask to school. But yet the school board has chose to not listen to that rule. But yet you are sending kids home when they are not listening to your rule. So I would ask that the school board get back together and they consider how inconsiderate it is of your school board not to abide by the rules of the Board of Education are the parents' choice of wearing a mask to school. And uh, so that would be one thing. You guys are asking for our support, and yet you're avoiding the rules that were set by the Board of Education. So I would just ask that you take that back to your school board members and uh, discuss that. And you can say that your attorney has given you direction. Your attorney works for you. And you are elected by the people. And so the people are the ones that you, you know, that, and especially the parents should be the ones that you should be, you guys should be listening for and following the rules by the Board of Education, who you are elected to do. So um, that's my comment on that, and I, I would hopefully request that you guys go back and reconsider that. Would you like for me to respond, Senator? You or absolutely you? can. Okay. Um, just as an update for you all, we certainly have submitted to the state how we believe that we are both following the rule, the original rule from the Department of Health, as well as statutory and constitutional. Um, it's part of the process for us to submit that information. The state then comes back and says, we agree, we don't agree, this is what you need to do, this is what you don't need to do. We do have a meeting scheduled for our October 5th um, because we feel like the entire school board should have an opportunity to weigh in on where we go from this point forward. And then we have a meeting with the State Board of Education on the 7th. So we are working through the process, but I think it's also part of the 
um, part of the process, if you will, to have those conversations and look at all of the details. Um, and by providing that information, that was, that was what the State Board laid out, what the, I'm sorry, the Department of Education laid out, was for us to submit how we think that we are in compliance. And then they tell us, yes, you are in compliance, no, you're not in compliance. So I absolutely respect your standing on it, but I think that we are, we're following the process as the state indicated that we should do. Um, and, and we look forward to what the State Board has to say on the 7th. Yeah, well, I respectfully disagree with that because the That's rule right. came out of Board of Education that said there would be a choice. And that choice was given prior to the school year starting. And now you have children that you are sending home without any opportunity to do learning. You don't have distance learning for these children. So, so you know, unfortunately, I respectfully disagree with your thoughts on that because the Board of Education did come out with a ruling and there wasn't a process to get together. Originally there was, that ruling came out and no, now there's not. It was a parent's choice um, on the mass mandate. So uh, I'm glad to see that you guys are getting back together, but I think you're, um, it needs to be sooner than later. So I respect you. your difference in perception, ma'am. Senator Mayfield, do you mind if I yeah, add So first, thank you for your, for your comment on that. I appreciate you saying it. I, I made a brief comment. I'll say something a little bit further. While I agree with you, it would be certainly good um, for the policy to be corrected at the next school board meeting. I don't give mulligans, and the policy was violated. I am the chairman of the K-12 Appropriations Subcommittee, and I will be considering that very deeply as we move forward in this legislative session. Children have, children have suffered. I have heard about it from their parents. I've heard about it from the children themselves is unconscionable. It violates every level of science. It's disgusting. And, this, and, and what is most disgusting is what Senator Mayfield pointed out, is that the school board said, we don't have to follow the rules, but you students do. It's irresponsible. You all have disgraced yourselves. And if I have anything to say about it, there will be severe consequences for it. Thanks for your input, Representative okay. Fine. Anyone else? Nope. You're good. All right. Thanks Thank for your you. time. You guys have a great day. You too. Uh, next, we have Janice Kershaw with the board, uh, the Bavard Sco uh, Schools Foundation. Hey, it's so great to see you. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Um, Bavard Schools Foundation serves as the nonprofit um, organization to support Brevard Public Schools, where we work to help fill educational funding and opportunity gaps that help create the graduates and the citizens that we need and the high performing teachers that we want. Now, if there's one thing that we've learned from the pandemic, it's just how much our entire economy depends on schools being open, not just so kids can learn, but so parents can go to work and companies can remain productive. What we didn't expect was the abundance of inventory that some companies were left with due to closures and wanted to donate to schools. Well, because we had the infrastructure in place with the supply zone for teachers, we were able to accept things like truckloads of high engagement books and learning materials from companies like Scholastic, literally hundreds of thousands of them, valued at more than $1 million to sort, pack, and redistribute to our schools. Key to us building the capacity to accept these large-scale donations like this is being able to leverage some state dollars to encourage private sector investment in the classroom through the School District Education Foundation Matching Grant Program, and we certainly want to thank you for your past support. Of the $6 million allocated for this school year, our Education Foundation is receiving $140,000, which we doubled to fund opportunities like Destination Space, the Supply Zone, Classroom Grants, and new this year, Teacher Fellowships for Conducting Action Research Projects, Educators Thriving to Support New Teacher Retention and Development, and the, Memor the More Memorial Park and Museum Experiential Learning Trip for All 8th Graders. I see my time is almost up, so I just want to ask that you make this proven statewide program a priority in the pre-K through 12 education budget for 22-23. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Next, we're going to have Janet Owens, the University of Central Florida. Go Knights. Thank you. Charge on. <laughs> Thank you so much. I bring you greetings and heartfelt thanks for your leadership and your support of the University of Central Florida. On behalf of our 70,000 students, 12,000 faculty and staff, and our UCF Board of Trustees, we graduate some 17,000 students each year who are ready to enter the workforce as employees or entrepreneurs, making um, opportunities for others. We continue to grow the talent that fuels Florida's economy and especially the exciting growth in Brevard County. 
percent of our graduates remain in Florida. 73 percent remain in an 11 county uh, area that we call Central Florida. There are 25,000 UCF graduates living and working in Brevard County. As we continue our progress towards increasing excellence and impact, we would like to highlight the following funding requests for the 2022 session. We are again requesting your support for our initiative to power up Florida's high-tech economy, building on our existing strengths in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, with an allocation under the Board of Governors Universities of Distinction, um, uh, pillars of excellence request will drive even more discoveries and advances to support a wide variety of high paying, high value industries in areas such as cybersecurity, space, defense, engineering, power systems, entertainment, and tourism. We will also increase the quantity and diversity of 21st century workforce preparedness and desperately needed STEM talent. Next, we look to advance medical education and healthcare in Central Florida. A $5 million recurring appropriation will allow us to hire crucial clinical and research faculty, better prepare our graduates, build more residencies and fellowships, um, address the physician's shortage, and lead the work of our Emerging Cancer Research and Treatment Center. Finally, in service to our increasing number of veterans, first responders, active duty service personnel, and others suffering uh, trauma, we request 515 thousand dollars in recurring support for vital no-cost treatment provided by the UCF PTSD clinic which notably provided mental health support to first responders uh, in the condo collapse at Surfside thank you so much Great. look forward to talking to you further about these issues thank you Janet uh, next we're gonna have Brian with the University of Florida go go Gators <laughs> gotta be fair good afternoon um, my name is Brian Abramowitz I'm a former middle and high school science teacher now I work at the University of Florida for a program called Scientists in Every Florida School. This is a free program for public schools and is currently funded by the University of Florida. The Scientists in Every Florida School program develops relationships between sci scientists and science teachers statewide. The scientists serve as role models for students and content expert mentors for the teachers. Beyond that, we facilitate scientist classroom visits as well as live stream programming that are all Florida State Standard aligned and innovative teacher professional development opportunities to help mitigate teacher attrition. Last year, we completed 1,800 scientist classroom visits, reaching more than 55,000 students in over 60% of Florida counties. This year, we're here and ready to do more. So I'm here asking for your support in getting Brevard County Schools more involved. At this time, the support would look like sharing with your contacts at the school uh, district, district leaders, about the program, how to get involved, as well as your colleagues in Tallahassee, because by doing so, we'll be able to better sustain and expand the program to better support our future generations of Floridians and truly live up to our name of putting a scientist in every Florida school on an annual basis. So with that, I wanna say thank you for the time. I really appreciate your support. Great, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, next is Arthur Edwards with uh, FAMU, National Alumni Association. Go Rattlers, right? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Chair and the delegation. On behalf of uh, FAMU and the FAMU Lee, I want to express appreciation for the support that you all have given us in the past. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to uh, report that your support has enabled FAMU to make notable improvements in student academic performance and student outcomes. In the latest rankings from the U.S. News and World's Report, FAMU ranked number 104 among all American public universities. And this was a 13-point increase from the number 117 ranking that we received last year. We were also, for the third year, ranked the highest uh, historical black college and university in America for the third year. Uh, what we're asking for today is funding to increase first time in college retention rates, improve the uh, licensure rate uh, in fields such as uh, nursing, pharmacy, and physical therapy, increase the number of baccalaureate degrees awarded uh, to transfer students, improve student recruitment and scholarship, uh, improve online education and innovation. More importantly, to support the SUS strategic priorities to increase student success and student access. I'm happy to report that FAMU moved up seven positions in social mobility ranking. 
uh, and we're now ranked number 13. This places FAMU uh, second only to FIU uh, in terms of uh, social mobility. Uh, one of the key uh, roles of the university is educating the economically disadvantaged and preparing underserved students for meaningful careers. Uh, we've done this for quite a long time, and we will continue with your help. Uh, we're the leading producer of degrees for bachelor's degrees for African Americans um, in several disciplines. Uh, with the recurring request of $15 million, we will continue with the success of our student population. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for your support in the past, and if you have any questions, uh, I would love to answer your questions. Great. Thank you, author, and thank you for being here and presenting. Uh, next, any questions, members? Okay. I have one. Oh, yes. Representative Altman. I'd like a, just a little update on the FAMU Law School in Orlando. The, well, I can tell you as much as I know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the law school has had some struggles, but I know that they've got a plan uh, to heal, and, and they're working that plan. Uh, one of the, uh, the issues has been the passing rate, and, and we're working that. And that's about as much as I know. It's good that it's good they're moving ahead. It's a great, a great program, and I think located right here in Central Florida. So we appreciate. Yeah, I have every confidence that we'll uh, uh, heal the things that need to be healed. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Tara with the Family Promise of Brevard. Hey there. Uh, the Space Coast of Florida is full of opportunities and innovation, but not every family in Brevard County is flourishing. Actually, 40% of families in our county are considered working poor in that they are working but are spending 50 to 80% of their income on housing costs. In zip codes like 32922 in COCO, the number of families facing housing instability jumps up to 73%. That is why last year, Family Promise of Brevard began efforts to relocate our base of operations into 32922 to create a hub of services that are accessible and impactful at preventing and ending family homelessness. This past month, we entered into a long-term lease with the city of Coco and, co and contracted for funding through our continuum of care to repurpose Firehouse Number 1, just east of the water tower, into our new base of operations. With 7,000 square feet, it's large enough to not only house our programs of prevention, shelter, and stabilization, but to also co-locate other agencies who provide services that address health, income, and education. Central to the hub will be a large community classroom for post-secondary education and industry certifications that quickly elevate residents to a living wage. This year, Family Promise of Brevard volunteered to be the backbone organization to create a local college access network called Elevate Brevard. This initiative brings a collaboration of community stakeholders together to increase college and credential attainment while closing employer skills gaps. I've shared collateral for both the Firehouse and the Elevate Brevard initiative, and I hope you'll consider ways that you can be part of this innovative project. Great, thank, thank you, Tara. Uh, next, we have Georgia, uh, Georgiana Gillette with the Space Coast Treasure, Treasure Coast Planning. Planning. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, delegation members. Um, I'm Georgiana Gillette with the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization, and we facilitate transportation planning for Brevard County government and our 16 municipalities. First, I want to thank you for allocating state funding to several of our top priorities, including the NASA Causeway Bridge Replacement. Now that the new I-95 Ellis Road Interchange is open, our number one ranked project is the widening of Ellis Road from two to four lanes. It will improve access for the growing daily population of 20,000 plus at MLB, plus thousands more working within a one mile radius of the airport. I have a letter from Director Donovan uh, expressing su su uh, support for the project as well, which I think he has sent to everyone. We're working very closely with our DOT partners, uh, Secretary Purdue, to develop a funding plan for construction. We, have, we want to be a funding partner, uh, and between the county and the TPO, we roughly have $10.5 million 
to match the FDOT funding for construction. Another critical project of regional significance is the widening of State Road 528. And so I'll end by discussing one of our policy positions, and that's funding. The reason we're not building more is that we're constrained by our revenue. The costs of building and maintaining roads are going up, along with rising right-of-way acquisition costs. Cars are getting better with fuel efficiency, and there's an increasing volume of electric vehicles on our roadways. We support any efforts by the Florida Department of Transportation to initiate a transportation revenue alternative study to analyze the various options for a revenue replacement source for the current motor fuel tax. And as we move into the 2020s and beyond, uh, improving our shared transportation system is going to require some bold solutions. But thank you very much for your time and your leadership. Thank you, Georgiana. Uh, next, we have Keith Winston with the East Coast Zoolo Zoology Society. Mouthful. What happened to Bavard Zoo? Let's just call it Bavard Zoo. <laughs> Why aren't you wearing a wolf shirt for this? You know, I was going to refer to that. I think I have some dress options I hadn't considered before. Yeah, well, um, I thought we had a dress option, too. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson Mayfield, and thank you, the whole delegation. First of all, thank you so much for what you came through last year for the aquarium for us, uh, a critical piece. We are really excited to report that this morning the Port Commission unanimously um, per, um, approved our development and agreement and our lease, which was an important piece to let us move forward with our campaign to raise the rest of the funds. And I want to tell you really good news. We have not started fundraising in a formal way for the aquarium project, um, and we are over $31 million in. Um, that includes 10 million committed by the county, the TDC funds. Uh, that means half a million from the state and over 20 million of private dollars. So that is our intent to match those public dollars two to one every step of the way we can or more with private dollars. We really appreciate the funding we got last year that's actually moved to the second phase of design. As you know, we have a request in this year for another $950,000, which is actually the first phase of construction. I just want to reiterate, we think this project brings so many things to Brevard County and to all of Florida and the Central Florida region. Um, it's terrific for our economy in terms of jobs and in, in terms of dollars. It is a light on the lagoon that will keep shining and make sure we do our best there. And in terms of recreational aspects that reflect our lifestyles and what we value here in Brevard County, being outside, being formally um, family oriented, and also using technology to better our world. It just wraps it all up. So I want to thank you for all the past support you've given us and look forward to future support and working with you to bring this to reality and seeing you all at the ribbon cutting in a few years. So thank you all. Great. Thank you. Members, any questions? Great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Next, we have Suzanne Taylor with the Guardian at Lighton. Lighten. Guardian Ed Lightum. Lightum. Good afternoon, Senator Mayfield and members of the d delegation. My name is Suzanne Taylor. I'm an attorney with the Guardian Ed Lightum program here in Brevard County. The Guardian Ed Lightum program was established by law in 1980. Florida statutes specify that the court shall appoint a Guardian Ad Lightum for an abused, abandoned, or neglected child at the earliest time in any child abuse proceeding to represent and advocate for his or her best interests. This dedicated advocacy is accomplished through the recruitment of citizens from the community who volunteer to be an advocate for children who work alongside child advocate managers and guardian ad litem attorneys like myself, who are at every hearing to protect children's legal interests in those proceedings. We support children and we give them a voice. Guardian ad litems give reports and recommendations to the judge that are exclusively about the child's best interests. Research shows that children who are represented by a volunteer advocate are less likely to return to foster care, have fewer placement changes, do better in school, are more likely to be adopted when the time comes, and overall spend less time in foster care. Statewide, we have over 10,000 volunteers and hundreds of pro bono attorneys advocating for children and donating legal services. In our community, we have over 1,000 children in the dependency system assigned to the Guardian Ad Litem program and over 225 outstanding volunteers who selflessly give their time and talents to advocate for kids. The volunteers, Guardian Ad Litem staff and attorneys work as a team to provide information to the court, give each child a voice and advocate for the best interests of the children. We also work very closely with community partners such as family allies, children's advocacy centers, and numerous business, business leaders, including our, who support our nonprofit Friends of Children of Brevard. We're stretching our resources to provide as much uh, to represent these children as possible 
Um, the Guardian of the Lighter program is able to draw down Title IV-E funding to represent additional children, and we'll be asking the legislature for trust authority, trust fund authority to do this. Our program deeply appreciates the longstanding partnership with the legislature. We're grateful for all the ways that you've helped us, and we invite you to come and uh, see us in action. I'm sure Judge McKibben would be more than happy to accommodate any of you before you consider any legislation that comes up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for all you do. Uh, next, we have uh, Susan uh, Susan McGarth. Uh, there you are. Do you, I, I'm, I am impressed. Everyone is where they're supposed to be. So this is moving very quickly. We follow so, instructions thank you. well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your time this afternoon to hear from so many worthy causes, uh, and especially um, to hear um, how your ongoing support and efforts are impacting Brevard Achievement Center, where we focus on employing and empowering more than 4,000 people of unique abilities each year. Last year, you all supported an appropriation request um, that was sponsored by Representative Fine. Thank you. And Senator Wright, thank you. Uh, these funds have allowed us to continue our work with adults with disabilities, specifically focusing on building employment skills in, in people with very significant levels of disability. I am incredibly proud to report to you today that this program continues to succeed. Uh, we have now successfully transitioned several participants from the program into part-time employment um, in roles at BAC where, we, uh, where they are earning pre a prevailing wage of $10.80 an hour for their work, well above the current minimum wage. This is truly wonderful news for people who likely never believe they may one day hold a job. Our thanks to Senator Wright and Representative Fine for once again sponsoring our current appropriation request this year with a small increase to $250,000. We respectfully ask the full delegation support in making this a request that's important for all of Brevard. This funding truly helps our participants continue to realize amazing outcomes. Please continue to help us send a signal to people of unique abilities that their dream to work and have some level of independence is important, that they are important, and help us send the signal that they matter. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Okay, next we have Crystal Morgan with United Launch Alliance, and you don't look like Crystal. <laughs> she looks a lot better than I do. Yeah, I would Senator. have to agree. Good afternoon. My name is, is Joe Mayer. I'm the Director of Government Relations for Lockheed Martin Space, and I served as the Chair of Florida Space Day 2021. I am speaking on behalf of Crystal Morgan, the Director of State Government Relations for United Launch Alliance and Chair of Florida Space Day 2022. Florida Space Day will take place in person in Tallahassee, Tallahassee on January 27th, and we look forward to engaging a wide range of STEM students as part of our Florida Space Day industry-led teams. Here's a quick preview of our messaging. First, space is alive, well, flourishing, and growing in Florida and certainly on the Space Coast and Burrard. We've completed 23 successful rocket launches, and ULA will soon be launching a major science asteroid mission called Lucy. SpaceX recently completed its Inspiration4 mission. Later this year, America will begin its journey to put the first woman and first person of color on the moon with the launch of the Orion spacecraft and on the Space Launch Rocket System as part of NASA's Artemis program. In addition, we have seen the expansion of spacecraft, rocket, and satellite manufacturing capabilities in Brevard. Second, Florida has a rich heritage of achievement in space and extraordinary potential to further build upon that in the years ahead. That is why Florida Space Day advocates for workforce training programs and apprenticeship initiatives that will help us meet the high-tech job requirements of today and in the future. It is why we support pro-space legislation, such as Representative Soroy's zero-G, zero-fee proposal, and why we have supported a full suite of economic development tools to attract new business and promote the expansion of existing space business. Bottom line, we look forward to Florida Space Day 2022, and we thank you, the members of this delegation, for your leadership on the Space Caucus 
and your leadership and support for U.S. leadership in space and here in Florida. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joe. Senator, uh, Senator Mayfield. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to say, I, I've got to leave now, but I wanted to let folks understand why. Um, I've been asked to represent Florida at the National School Choice Conference, where I'll be speaking tomorrow. And I felt that given the twin crises we face in public education of critical race theory and parents being told you're not welcome to have an opinion about your children's education, I should go and talk about what we're doing in Florida and how we can do more. So I want to let folks know, even though I am leaving, I'll be listening to this in the car on the way to the airport. I will, if anything I miss, I will watch later. And at least, I think with all of us, you, it's not that hard to get more than a minute. Um, so if you really want to talk about these issues more, I generally take all first meetings with people, depending on the first meeting. There may not be a second, but Nancy will be here, and, um, and you can ask for, for more time. So I want to apologize that I do have to go, but uh, thank you all for coming, and I will, I will listen to what everybody has to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Representative Fine. Okay, next we have uh, Vince Lamb with the Bavard Indian River Lagoon delegation. Good afternoon. It's great to see you Good again. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to address you on behalf of the Indian River Lagoon Coalition. First, a little history of speaking about our, our lagoon. In 2016, Bavard County citizens overwhelmingly uh, voted to tax themselves to raise funds needed to restore the lagoon. With great leadership from Brevard County's natural resources, we've implemented a plan that is greatly reducing the man-made pollution that's killing our lagoon. The plan addresses stormwater, septic systems, inefficient sewage treatment, muck removal, and more. The tax is expected to raise almost a half billion dollars over its 10-year life. This is a great start, but unfortunately it's only a start. We need more in regulatory changes and significantly more funding. The lagoon is the central point of our county. Splitting it lengthwise from north to south, we identify ourselves as beachsiders and mainlanders. Yet for decades, we've been dumping pollutants into the lagoon to the point that it's now a very damaged ecosystem. The, uh, the time to act to save the lagoon is now. We're thankful to, uh, to Governor DeSantis, who saw the need and directed $53 million to Brevard and our neighboring counties for septic to sewer conversion and sewer plant improvement. This helps to address the, the, the serious need, but unfortunately much more funding is needed to truly restore the lagoon. We need statesmen that are bold enough to make tough decisions that will create the conditions needed to restore the lagoon. It's a difficult problem. If it was easy, your predecessors would have solved it long ago. The, action, the, the alternative to action is that we continue our destructive ways and we end up with an algae-dominated ecosystem with little commercial or aesthetic value. All right. Moving here in, in 1970, I can remember when the lagoon was the nation's most diverse estuary. The lagoon was so clean that we could enjoy it without worrying about our health. Let's act now to ensure the future, the future generations of Brevard residents have the same experience. Thank you, Mr. Lamb, and thank you for your your uh, participation in this. And right. and you know it wouldn't. I, I I do have to indicate that Governor DeSantis has put record funding, record funding in our lagoon for the last three years. And we all know this is not going to happen overnight. Um, we didn't get here overnight, and it's not going to happen overnight. But we do have the grant programs, and we have been funding for the wastewater treatment facilities, advanced ones, the stormwater runoff, the septic to sewer. There's, there's many, many projects that we have going right now. And thank you for, for being involved in that. But I just don't want people to think that we're not doing anything. Uh, right. for, and we appreciate for, your leadership with Senate Bill 712 and the impact that it has had. You're quite welcome. Thank but you. we will continue it. Yeah. And uh, we have to keep it on the forefront, no yeah. doubt. And we will continue. Uh, to make sure that we continue the the fundings that's needed for the lagoon. So thank you for your involvement. And and I'm going to take a point of, of, of special privilege here since I'm the chair. Um, Dr. Uh, DeFries, who is usually at these meetings, and he is not going to be here today, but he has been a champion in making sure that our lagoon and our national estuaries have been funded in legislation to help keep them going in the right direction to to clean up. So I want to show my, you know, just my appreciation of how much work he has also done on making sure that our, our lagoon is, uh, is going in the right direction. Thank you for expressing Thank that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Members, next we are going to hear from Jack Mason, the Boys and Girls Club of Central Florida. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the delegation. My name is Jack Masson. Uh, I serve as the chair of the board of directors for the Brevard County Boys and Girls Clubs, and also I'm a member of the Central Florida Boys and Girls Club Board of Directors. Um, the Boys and Girls Club of Central Florida is a member of the Boys and Girls Club Alliance, representing 243 branches with over 200,000 club members statewide. The Alliance is respectfully requesting the state legislature continue to support the Boys and Girls Clubs statewide by the allocation and designation of funding in the 2022 budget. The funding would be through a combined effort of DOE, DOJJ, and the state's opioid Pre <coughs> prevention fund. Excuse me. Our goal is to provide a path to success for the children living on the wrong side of the opportunity gap. In Brevard County, 91% of our members qualify for free and reduced lunch. Over 76% of the families earn less than 30,000 a year. Only 30% of our club members live in two parent households. We know that the children who come with these circumstances are less likely to graduate from high school, attend college, stay employed, are more likely to be unemployed as adults, be incarcerated, and fall victim to drug abuse and homelessness. Academic stu studies show that the investing in over over underserved children, for every dollar spent, there's a $9.60 return in economic impact. Thank you for your continued support the Boys and Girls mission is so important in today's society. There are so many children that are begging for our help. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, next, we have Paul Owens with the, Fr the Thousand Friends of Florida. Hey, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Senator and members of the delegation. 1,000 Friends of Florida is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based in Tallahassee, but we're engaged on growth issues throughout Florida, including Brevard County. 1,000 Friends believes in smart, sustainable development to accommodate our rapid growth in Florida while preserving our environment and quality of life, the foundation of our healthy economy. I'm going to highlight three of our legislative priorities for the 2022 session, which we consider worthy priorities for uh, your constituents. First, restore the rights of Floridians to challenge development orders that are inconsistent with local comprehensive plans. The legislature changed the law in 2019 to put those Floridians at risk of financial ruin if they lose their challenge. In a state growing as fast as Florida, citizens need to recover the right to make sure their communities are growing in accordance with their local comp plans. Second, conserve more natural and agricultural lands before they're lost forever to development by maintaining historic funding for the Florida Forever program. We'd like to see another strong year for conservation funding, no matter how many dollars Congress makes available. And third, fully carry out the recommendations of the governor's task forces on blue-green algae and red tide and increase funding for water quality improvements and monitoring in impaired waterways like the Indian River Lagoon. Legislators did get a good start with the Clean Waterways Act of 2020, and we thank you for your leadership on that, Senator Mayfield. Uh, but there is more progress to be made. We hope you will give serious consideration to these priorities. Thank you for your service to our, this community and our state. Great. Thank you, Paul. Any questions, members? Yeah, I do. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Representative Altman has a question. Thank you for what you do. We certainly, I certainly appreciate the work of the Thousand Friends of Florida. And we have a lot of work to do. Um, but don't forget brown algae. I hear a lot of people talk about blue-green algae and red tide. But what's destroying the lagoon here in Bavard is brown algae. 
And uh, I think it's even more insidious here than the blue-green algae because the blue-green algae is somewhat episodic and they have a lot of tidal mixing in the south end of the lagoon, whereas here it just stays. And we are, are, we're seeing the desertification of our lagoon because of the brown algae. There's no seagrass. That's why we've lost, what, six or 800 manatees starved to death. So I just want to mention that. I, I hear a lot of conversation but, about blue-green, but brown is just as bad or worse. And again, I appreciate what you do. And, Thank you. For Thank you, and we appreciate the fact that you and, and Representative Placencia have highlighted the need to make the Indian River Lagoon a, a restoration priority up at, to, to the extent like right. uh, the Everglades has right. been a restoration priority. We support that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, uh, and Paul, I, I actually, uh, I'm sure you saw this, but Governor DeSantis in their last cabinet meeting approved over a hundred million dollars in Florida Forever um, money that was in the budget to purchase uh, land and also to purchase conservation uh, areas and easements. So I think that, you know, that is shared uh, with Governor DeSantis and the whole legislature um, on preserving Florida. So thank you for your leadership in that as well. Thank you. And we, we saw that and appreciated it. Great. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to have Phoebe with the Children's Home Society of Florida. Phoebe, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm Phoebe Whalen, the Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services for Children's Home Society. On behalf of all of us at Children's Home Society, thank you for your public service. And with all the challenges before our state, your unwavering commitment is the leadership we need. We stand ready to support you and your staff. I do want to publicly recognize Representative Thad Altman for earlier this week being honored by myself and other statewide CHS leadership as our CHS 2021 Representative of the Year. Thank you, Representative Altman, for your efforts this past season on behalf of children and families we serve in the child welfare system and look forward to your continued leadership and additional improvements. We appreciate the delegation's continued support for the Community Partnership School model. Today, there are 26, 20, excuse me, 26 Community Partnership Schools in Florida, including one right here in Brevard County, Endeavor Elementary. We know all of these schools have become more than just a place to learn, but serve as a resource for our students, their parents, and the community with opportunities for expanded learning, addressing the needs to access wellness, care, and including mental health and dental services. With your support, we are changing lives and creating brighter futures. Through community partnership schools, we've seen improved attendance, improved reading levels, improved classroom behavior, and increased graduation rates and teacher retention. We've seen more youth enroll in college. Through community partnership schools, we are building a stronger Florida. We are requesting additional funds this session to expand this proven model to positively impact more students in Florida, and we ask for your continued support. Thank you again. Great, thank you, Phoebe. Any questions? I, I just wanna thank uh, Children's Home Society and the work. I did have an opportunity to see one of, the, one of their facilities, the one here in Bovard, and I was absolutely amazed with the facility, with the community support that you generate, and the incredible um, skill and ability of your staff. It's probably the best investment we make in society, our, our, our children and those who are most vulnerable. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Pamela uh, Gunthrop with the South Bavard Sharing Center. Yes. Thank you to everyone here today for your dedication and your hard work. Before the end of the shuttle program, Bavard County leaders came together to plan how, as a community, we would overcome the economic catastrophe marked by the loss of more than 30,000 jobs. Working together, the Space Coast bounced back. Our economy is thriving. And just two days ago came another successful announcement, Terran Orbital, 2,100 jobs, paying an average $84,000 a year. But today, housing prices are skyrocketing, and our minimum wage and service sector neighbors have nowhere to go. Brevard County and all of Florida is facing an affordable housing crisis. 
Not a day goes by that I don't meet another family sleeping in a car, couch surfing, or living in a tent in the woods, or the family they can't afford to save up enough money for a security deposit first and last month's rent because they're living in a hotel room. At South Brevard Sharing Center, we are receiving daily, we are receiving calls daily asking, pleading for assistance. Community leaders have made strategic investments to bring great jobs to the Space Coast. I ask you and community leaders across Brevard to join in a conversation to address the affordable housing crisis. The Space Coast is known for its culture of innovation and its quality of life. But that quality of life is disappearing for those who can't afford the simplest place to live. Who will prepare the pumpkin spice latte for the satellite engineer on her way to work? Who will stock the shelves at the grocery store for the technician on his way home to his family? Today I ask you please to reconsider sweeping Sadowski funds to pay for other infrastructure projects. Now is the time to work together again to overcome this housing crisis. Will you join the South Brevard Sharing Center and other nonprofit partners to support sustainable partnerships that build affordable housing, foster and house a needed workforce, and create economic growth throughout underserved areas of Brevard? Thank you for your time to tackle these challenging problems. Great. Thank you, Pamela. And just as an FYI, we did pass legislation last year that would prohibit the sweeping of the Sadowski funds. So um, thank you. So hopefully that. Uh, like Hopefully said, it'll start to make a difference. Yes, it will. Thank you very much. Uh, members of our audience, let me also make a request. Um, there are people that is going to be speaking that cannot get into the room here because they're in the overflow room. So if you are not speaking, if you would please allow them to come in and sit and speak so that we can keep this moving along so everyone has an opportunity uh, to speak because we still have quite a few people uh, to go through and I was just asked that by uh, by my staff because they're trying to monitor this out in the hallway Okay members with that we have law uh, Larry uh, O'Starley with the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse Foundation. Hey, Larry uh, First of all, thanks for having an in-person meeting uh, last year I think I was like number 80 on the agenda and I went to speak and it dropped off oh. <laughs> so so it was, it was painful, but I got to hear the good works of everyone else. So we, we, we appreciate should give them double person. time. Oh, double no, time. don't go there. I'll have people uh, mad Cape, at me. Cape Canaveral Lighthouse Foundation, basically its mission is to share the light. Uh, the lighthouse is celebrating its 153rd anniversary on the Space Force Base, which is very unique to have a lighthouse on a Space Force Station. And we're pleased to say, even through the pandemic, you know, we were able to open the Keeper's Cottage uh, and establish our museum. And that was thanks to a TDC grant and a legislative grant that allowed us to put that in place. Our long-term goals are to build two additional cottages to enhance our education program and to establish a period furniture to continue to help understand the history of the lighthouse and, and that unique structure on in Brevard County. Uh, our visitors, you know, we've had, so it's interesting when you, when you look at the challenges of um, visiting a lighthouse on a Space Force station, it really takes the cooperation of the base commander to allow that. And, and, and the Space Force has been very helpful in ensuring that we're able to continue to share it. We shared it with 2,000 people over this last year, 39 states, four countries, and it's truly uh, an exciting place to visit and uh, hopefully Y'all will have time to come out and see our museum again. We'd like to share it with yourselves and your families. I put my contact information in the package if you desire to do that. And uh, anyway, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Great. Thank you, Larry. Members, any questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, members, next we have uh, Nicole with the Surf, Surf uh, Rider Foundation. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Mayfield and Brevard delegation. Um, my name is Nicole Devenoche, and I'm the Florida Policy Manager for the Surfrider Foundation. We're a nonprofit dedicated to protecting the oceans, waves, and beaches, particularly through our 11 chapters, including your constituents here in the Space Coast. We are dedicated to protecting the marine environment and the harmful impacts of plastics and nutrient pollutants. Um, that are having uh, on our greatest resource here, our blue economy. 
I'm here to ask the delegation to make it a priority to fully fund the Department of Health's Florida Healthy Beaches program with one and a half million dollars. You may notice that this is far beyond the previous $500,000 ask, but under allocation and increased testing costs have put our state program down to 186 testing sites from the 304 testing sites we had in 2005. The grave state of many of our impaired waterways and the protection of public health, wildlife, and blue economy should be a priority for us all. Currently, this insufficient testing leaves almost half the upper portion of the state with no testing for four months out of the year, and the rest of the state at at most biweekly. With significant repairs to our sewer and stormwater infrastructure still needed, increase in red tides, algal blooms of all colors, explosive development, UMEs of our manatees, and the struggles of our beloved Indian River Lagoon, we are concerned about beach closures, closures human illnesses, and fish kills. Um, thanks to our dedicated Space Coast Surfrider volunteers, an alert system is put online. We do work alongside the Florida DEP and the MRC and these tests I actually sent in a, with Carly, I believe, um, some of our latest tests. Uh, the second ask is to please on the um, smoking bill um, in the parks and public beaches. No one mentioned beaches. It is our number one litter item. So we would really appreciate you supporting that. Thank you so much. For Great. Thank you, Nicole. And I do hope to see you up up in Tallahassee. I will be there. I miss seeing all the, the especially the kids that you brought up with January you January 27th. We have our date booked. Okay. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to it. January 27th. Okay. Next, we have Dr. Hawkins Smith. And she represents the historic Coco Village Playhouse. Welcome. Thank you so much. Yes, I do represent the historic Coco Village Playhouse. We're in our 32nd year of uh, service to our community. We believe in lifelong education through the performing arts and service to the community. When the pandemic uh, broke out, it was very, very difficult to go from being up 9% to completely closure. Uh, but we didn't close. We continued to serve the community. Our costume department sewed 5,000 face masks and gave them out to our community. But I am so thrilled to say that we opened this past weekend with Beauty and the Beast, and we had audiences of almost 2,000 total people this weekend. And right now, as we speak, our Stars of Tomorrow youth directors are auditioning our children, which is a huge part of our theater program, ages seven through high school graduation. And we were on our 200th child when we left today. So we are encouraged that the community Community will be back and support the performing arts. Not only have I been at the theater for 32 years, but I've been asked today by the Brevard Cultural Alliance to again remind you to please support uh, the funding for general programming support through the Florida Arts and Culture Division. It serves over 400 organizations of which we are one right now, and we've been approved for funding this year. So so we also have in your packet, this was all we could afford to print this year, but it's one page telling you everything that you need to know for the upcoming season. Do you have any questions today? No, any questions? Uh, Representative Saroy. I just wanted to thank you for offering me the part of the beast. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that my schedule was full, but uh, I look forward to the Nutcracker later, well, later this year. Well, you are so welcome, and we have a position reserved for you for the Nutcracker. I actually thought you were going to say the beauty. No, no, no. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be you, Madam Chair. I don't well, think so. I don't, know, I don't know if I have a yellow yeah. dress for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll they, work they on fit. that. Right. <laughs> well, I'm just, did you okay. offer him that because of... It would save a lot of money and make up costs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just kidding, Rep. Just kidding. Thank you so much. Thank and it's you. wonderful to see smiles on your faces. You do such a great job of representing us, and we appreciate you so much. You're Thank you. You're quite welcome. And I know you guys have a great board as well, uh, and you've come up to Tallahassee, so hopefully we will see you guys up in Tallahassee Thank next you. Year. Our pleasure. Thank, Thank you. I do have to say something, Madam Chairman, and I'll Go be ahead. quick. The quality of your programming. It's, um, it's just Broadway quality. Uh, 
And the music blows my mind. The live music. It's just amazing. Amazing. Thank you for what Thank you do. Thank you so much, and we will not give up. Uh, we were very discouraged, but we're holding on and not giving up and have so much faith now that the children are returning. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to follow up because I did read the CARES Act legislation yes. from cover to cover. Yes. And I know it was so limiting. You were not able to, to benefit. I know movie theaters with a fixed seating, yes. got a tremendous amount of money. Now, you you were a former movie theater, historically. In 1924, yes. I came with the building. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in 1924. You should have qualified. I don't know if there's anything we can do to try to break loose those funds, but maybe we ought to maybe Perhaps we could collaborate yes. um, and figure out if there is a way it just didn't make sense to right. us. Right. Um, and we of all people desperately uh, need this to keep the arts alive, yes? So shall well, we reach out? Reach out to all of us. I know you're in uh, Representative uh, Troy's, the beauty. The, the beauty. Beast. Let's, <laughs> district. Let's work together and see if we can. Because well, we really it doesn't make any that. sense whatsoever yes. that you would get nothing. Yeah. We really no appreciate that. Okay. And I think Bavard County also received quite a bit of the CARES money yeah. as well. So there may be some more flexibility. We in what did they receive did. some of the Bavard CARES money. Yes, we did. we did. But it did, I agree, it did not make sense. Yeah. So great. Thank you. We'll reach out. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next, we have uh, one of my favorite resources. Uh, on the Indy River Lagoon, and that's uh, uh, Lisa Soto. Lisa represents the Marine Resources Council of East Florida. E. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to speak today at the delegation for all of your hard work. You guys have done a tremendous job up in Tallahassee bringing home the bacon for the Indian River Lagoon. Can't thank you enough. You know, the amount of appropriations coming down, uh, the infrastructure projects, the stormwater, wastewater uh, projects, it's fantastic. Um, I work for the Marine Resources Council. We are a community-supported charitable organization dedicated to protecting and restoring the Indian River Lagoon. We're small but mighty, a nonprofit committed to using science to guide education and policy. We are the producers of the Indian River Lagoon Report Card, uh, which um, se several of you have benefited from to support your, your causes and your cases in Tallahassee. If you need these, you know, we've got boxes of them, we can get them up to you. We are um, asking the state agencies that produce these data to get us the data as quickly as possible. We still don't have data to update this report. The reason that I'm here today is to tell you that I am confident that we can bring our Indian River Lagoon back to health, but it is going to take all of us, the entire region, all five counties, all the cities, the nonprofits, the agencies, et cetera. And, and I propose that we can do this one lagoon effort um, the following, the, with the following way. There are many organizations working on the lagoon, and we're working so hard that we barely have time to come up for a breath let alone reach out a hand in partnership. The truth is we need a reason to unite in a common objective that will benefit everybody. The Thousand Points of Life project galvanizes our coastal community as one lagoon in pursuit of 1,000 points of data to assess lagoon health, identify wastewater sources of pollution, measure ecological resources, and identify toxins. I welcome the opportunity to talk to you more about it one-on-one -on -one as we move forward. Uh, the current appropriations cannot address this, so I'm going to be seeking to put in a request for legislative appropriations for this project. I thank Great. you for all your hard work. And I've got resources available for you when you're ready for them. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And the, our next is Josh Jensen with Aging Matters in Bavard. Welcome, Josh. Good to see you again, Senator. It's good to see you too, Josh. So um, I'm Josh Jensen, President and CEO of Aging Matters in Brevard. And mostly people know that we're the lead agency for senior services in the county, Meals on Wheels and things. But I want to talk to you today about community care for the elderly funding. <clears throat> Excuse me. We currently in Brevard County have a waiting list for community care of elderly CCE of over 1,000 seniors. You guys have been generous in the past. The governor has been generous in the past. But I would like you to help support the Florida Council on Aging and trying to secure more money. Morally, it makes sense to keep people in their homes as long as they can do so safely. But then from a financial standpoint, CCE compared to Medicaid in a nursing home 
is CCE's eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month compared to what ten thousand dollars a month in a nursing home. So it makes sense fiscally, fiscally too. So when the Florida Council on Aging comes knocking this January, I hope you will listen and thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Josh. And um, again, I, you know, I w did have an opportunity to uh, um, go with you guys on, and it was uh, if no one, if you haven't done it in the audience, um, you know, I would encourage you to get involved with it because it is they have a a well oiled machine to get the food out to the citizens that are homebound, and it is it is very heartwarming uh, to do that. So thank you for your service. And we always appreciate your support. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, next members, um, we are going to, now we're in the citizens and community organizations section. Um, I have been told that there's been quite a few people that have come in. Uh, if you are in and you do intend to speak, you need to fill out a public appearance card in the back of the room so that we know you are here to speak. Um, so with that, I am going to jump around on the calendar uh, on in the agenda members and if you notice we've had to start the tabs over again because we ran out and we are going to flip to tab 17 bart you you are you are going to come up because i know you have a previous in, another engagement that you have to get to so you are going to be on deck first he's 17. Uh, good evening. I come before you this evening as a private individual to address the private gun range issue. I fully support the Second Amendment and I own a weapon and have a concealed permit. My concern is State Statute 790.15, which allows private property owners to shoot any caliber weapon without restrictions as long as they have the following conditions are met. The land is over 1.25 acres, they have a home, and <clears throat> surrounding neighbors must have more than one acre. So I meet all those, that criteria. The state ta statute completely ignores home rule and even states in Florida State Statute 79.33 that state law prohibits local government from regulating the entire field of fire arms and ammunition. Local officials could potentially be held personally liable if they enact firearms ordinances regulations. And I see I'm about out of time. I only had a minute, but is that correct? That, you, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I will tell you that I have a neighbor that is shooting his weapons 12 hours a day in some cases. Um, I hear people say, well, it's an affront to my Second Amendment right. What about the property owners? I've been there 31 years. This guy moved in two years ago, and he's firing weapons all the time. I think this is uh, an aberration. I think this is something that could be easily fixed by just saying, let's compromise. Let's have some days of the week so some of us can have some peace. There are people with PTSD. There's a lot of veterans in the area, people that work shift work first responders, we need to consider them. So I thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Bart, very much. Um, now, we are also ahead of schedule, which is good, and I think part of that is because people have kept to their time. Uh, so we are gonna allow a minute and a half until we see that we may be running out of time. But I think we, if everyone is considerate, we'll be able to get through everyone within a minute and a half. So with that, we're gonna go to Anthony uh, with the Bavard Federation of Teachers. Anthony, I thought I saw you walk in. Welcome. And we're under TAP 36 members now. I'm the president of the Brevard Federation of Teachers, the union that represents Brevard's 5,000 outstanding teachers. Senator Mayfield, you may remember the first time we met was nearly a decade ago and the topic of that discussion was standardized testing. With that said, I'm extremely pleased with the governor's decision to eliminate our FSA exams. This will provide additional time for our teachers to offer meaningful instruction. I'm hopeful that teachers will be provided the opportunity to give input as the new system of progress monitoring is created and request that you all will support those endeavors. I was thrilled that last year we were able to raise our beginning teacher pay by over $7,000. And I thank you for your work to make that happen. With that said, that does bring me to one of the most 
pressing issues we are facing in our district, the issue of veteran teacher pay. Laws governing pay have exploded from around 350 words to over 1,700 words over the past 10 years, creating a situation where our veteran teachers have not been fairly compensated for their success and dedication. For instance, a teacher with 22 years of experience in all highly effective evaluations is only making $4,175 more than a brand new teacher. A new teacher to the district with 20 years experience is making the same as a brand new teacher. We ask that as you head into session, that, um, you continue to increase your investments in salaries and that you prioritize districts uh, having flexibility in order to make salary increases achievable for all, not just first time teachers. Thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you, Anthony. And I really do appreciate you acknowledging the work that the governor has done to help with the teacher's pay mm -hmm. um, and the standardized testing, because that was something that we had talked about in the past. So thank you for acknowledging yes. that and giving him credit for that and all the work that you do. Thank you. Okay, next we have Sandra Sullivan with Wave Section LLC. Sanction LLC, sorry. Yeah, Waves Action LLC, thank you. Um, so I respectfully request a PFOS state standard uh, cleanup target by FDEP. Uh, Patrick Space Force Base is the third highest PFOS affecting the lagoon health and our communities as these chemicals are far more volatile than previously thought and a risk of vapor intrusion. Also, um, hashtag our community matters. I respectfully request to enforce the Florida Community Trust State Agreements because our Barrier Island community is a critical evacuation deficiency. The risk is fast moving hurricane like Andrew where time will not get everybody off the Barrier Island. The Florida Administrative Code that governed the FCT funding conservation lands required Satellite Beach and Brevard County to cap density on the Barrier Island in response to evacuation deficiency. There's also an adjacent property clause in the covenants with height limitations and land use restrictions. Ignoring the state agreements will uh, mean lo um, lost lives, mark my words. Governor DeSantis's resiliency funding of $1 billion over four years prioritizes Barrier Island hurricane evacuation deficiency. Your action is, cr is critical to protect our lives. Thank you. Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Sandra. Next, we'll go to uh, Lois LaCosta with the North Brevard Republican Club. You've been sitting there patiently. Thank you. <laughs> I have to sit in the front because I wear two hearing aids and I can't hear if I don't sit in the front. No problem. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, I presented each of you with a packet for what I'm going to speak about this evening because having only one minute that doesn't give me enough time to cover everything. Uh, we must stop critical race theory in our Florida schools. Governor Ron DeSantis has banned the teaching of critical race theory in Florida public schools. However, even our own Brevard County School Board has chosen to dress it up by calling it the Office of Equity and Diversity with the hiring of a director, Dr. Danielle McKinnon. No matter what title you want to give it, Stop dividing and segregating our children by educating them to judge each other by the color of their skin, both black and white students. I am asking each of you to please write down the following information and take time to watch two videos posted on YouTube. One by North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson on Independence Day 2021 and the other by a concerned father of three, Derek Wilburn, executive director at Rocky Mountain Black Conservatives at a recent school board meeting in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Both black men tell you in no uncertain terms the derogatory side of critical race theory, equity and diversity, black lives matter, and even reparations. And I'm out of time. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank Lois. You. We have Robin Ricker with the North Bavardi Republican Club. Robin's not here. Okay. Um, and then we have Rick Lacey, the Bavard Republican Party uh, Executive uh, um, Chairman. Hey. Thank you. Don't get up. <laughs> <laughs> 
speaking on behalf of the 192,000 plus Republicans in the county, uh, I'm their chairman, and I want to thank you all for hosting this today, giving us a chance. First, I want to congratulate Senator Mayfield on being the best majority leader Florida has ever had. Next, I want to say, Senator Tom Wright, thank you for supporting our space industry and our law enforcement community. Representative Altman, thank you so much for the legislation on, on uh, improving uh, water quality in the lagoon. Uh, Coach Palencia, wherever you are, thank you for your legislation on health care and juvenile justice reform. <clears throat> and Representative Tyler Soroy, congratulations on a long list of accomplishments, including helping homeless veterans, improving education, and helping restore the Indian River Lagoon. That's why you were selected the 2021 Brevard Legislator of the Year. <clears throat> Debbie, Tom, Thad, Rene, and Tyler, you are Brevard's all-star team. You put Brevard County on the map. Together with Governor DeSantis, you are the reason that Florida is the envy of the nation. And as chairman of the Republican Party, you make me proud to be a Republican. I cannot list all of your accomplishments in 60 seconds or even 60 minutes. All I can say is keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I really appreciate more that. Let's do more time. No. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Okay, God next God we, ha <laughs> we have Karen with the uh, Florida Freedom Keepers. Good afternoon. I'm Karen McCullough. I'm a wife, a mother, a voter, and an ambassador with Florida Freedom Keepers. We're a grassroots movement that advocates for medical and religious freedom. We're one of 48 state and 18 uh, international chapters. We have grown tremendously this last year as people rightly believe they should maintain freedom of making decisions over their own body. I thank you for your service to our communities, for myself, and also on behalf of all the following speakers, because we thought we had 60 seconds and prepared for that. Um, so they may not use up just a few moments in order to say thank you. Please know that we appreciate and want to work with you. My family and I have campaigned and sign waved and door knocked for all of you. We are grateful for what you've done in Brevard for our lagoon and the space industry, but today I'm calling on you to protect the rights of all Floridians. Many of us are wearing yellow ribbons in memory of those who have unnecessarily died of COVID and for those who have been injured or died from the COVID vaccine. We need uncensored medical transparency from our regulating agencies and informed consent for all people. I ask you to protect Florida from federal overreach and censorship and ensure medical freedom as soon as possible. Thank you. Great, thank you, Karen. And, and as you all know, uh, Governor DeSantis, we did pass the bill last year on the um, um, vaccination ma uh, mandate and the passport. So he is continually fighting that from yes. the federal government level. We have filed appeal uh, on that as well as the appeal for the um, uh, mass mandates that's going on in our, in our um, education system. We are so thankful for DeSantis and we hope that he is reelected. We hope that the elections are fair and audited so that we can get all of you back in here if you're willing to help us repeal 381, the forced vaccine mandate. Great. Thank you Thank so much. You. Next we have Salvador Gano with Martin the... Martin Gano. <laughs> Martin Gano. Yeah. I'm Dr. Sal Martin Gano, <clears throat> and I'm speaking to prevent trespassing on the oath of office affidavits taken by many of you here today. Many of our healthcare facilities and schools, private or otherwise, have mandated <clears throat> employee vaccinations or face, term or face terminations. So far, some federal judges have upheld the vaccine mandates based on unconstitutional arguments about the efficacy and suspicion of dangerous vaccine ingredients. Employees lost because the suspicions are not verifiable evidence. The correct argument should have been to demand verifiable material evidence showing the isolation of COVID-19 in human beings, which would be key to requiring vaccinations. As yet, none exists from the FDA or the CDC. However, in Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo, it was ruled that even in a pandemic, the, the Constitution cannot be put away or, or forgotten. The Fourth Amendment secures the rights of people to be secure in their persons and for unreasonable search and seizure and shall not be violated. So I'm asking you, where is the verified material evidence to validate these mandates? Now I'm saying this with all due respect, I've submitted information hopefully to you uh, that uh, has proofs. There's, there's two or 40 of them that I have that I put down 
and um, it shows this in great detail. So I don't want to take your time with all that stuff, but it is there. If you don't have it, I can submit it later. If I just checked with Clark because it is not in our package. So if you will make sure that Kaylee in the back um, gets a copy of it, we will make sure that all the other delegation members uh, receive a copy of it as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have Allison Holly with the uh, Florida Freedom Keepers. The government of our country was founded on fundamental ideals of freedom. A key ideal is that human rights are universal, and in every person, they may not be taken away. Another principle of freedom, the government is permitted to exist in order to protect human rights. One of those human rights is the right to bodily autonomy, especially when making medical choices. Over 50 years ago, the Nuremberg Code decreed that in medical decisions, the patient must be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. So 50 years later, how do we still have a law on the Florida books that allows the state health officer to order forced vaccinations by any means necessary? How is the president of our country ordering totalitarian health measures and Florida has not effectively pushed back? I do want to address since I have a little extra time. I know you said there are laws out there. They're just not protecting the individuals. There are still so many people worried about losing their jobs with companies coming out saying you are going to lose your job if you don't take this medical intervention. So I'm asking today that you support or introduce bills to remove forced vaccinations from Florida law and ban any requirements for vaccination as a condition of employment or requirement to participate in society. Please help protect all the citizens of Florida and ensure that Florida remains a bastion of freedom. Thank you. Great, thank you, Allison. And next we have Jordan Johnson with the Florida Freedom Keepers. I get to say good afternoon because I have afternoon. 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Critical legislation is needed now for all Floridians because of the imminent push for vaccination cards to work and travel. We must ensure that human and civil rights are protected and will prevent further economic hardship on our families and communities. Please protect our right to work despite vaccination status. I live in Titusville and I can't tell you how many friends are fearing how they're going to feed their children because their husband works out on federal property and this mandate is rolling out fast. Most are unaware that under the PrEP Act of 2005, the makers of the COVID vaccines have near blanket immunity from liability. If a family member or I is injured or killed, no one will bear responsibility, not the manufacturer, not the doctor, not the government or the employer who chose to mandate it. We alone will be left with the consequences and medical bills. Under current U.S. Supreme Court law to mandate a medical intervention, there must be an epidemic that imperils the entire population. According to the CDC's own data, COVID survival rates for those under 70 stands at 99.5% or higher, which does not warrant mandating this vaccine. That was prior to the introduction of the vaccine. This is an excerpt from one of many of my unanswered emails and letters and phone calls to my absent representative from January of this year before session. Everything I just read to you, I have tried. You all took an oath to uphold the Constitution and are accountable to the people. If anyone is unable to do their job due to this pandemic, they should leave office. Please take action. Thank you. Jordan, um, uh, thank you very much. But I, I would ask that if we wouldn't call out people's names, this is it's not really appropriate. Um, we do have a, 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 a policy within committee hearings that we don't call members out. Um, and so I would ask that you that you not do that. Um, I know that this is a is the federal government is the one coming down with these mandates. Yes. And we are hard, working as hard as we can. Governor yes. DeSantis has filed uh, has filed court, and, and actually, um, Attorney General Ashley Moody has as well. Um, yes. So you know, it should be state law. It we should, should be protected. And we can make a state law, but yeah. the federal law trumps the state law. So that's what we are. We, that's what we're working on. When they say it's a, a pandemic. That is what's happening right now. So Under we hear emergency. you, and we're working on it. Okay, okay. and right. we will look at this. I mean, we'll. we'll I just made a note for uh, uh, Carly to take so that we could look into the policy and see. And we'll also present it to uh, Attorney General Ashley Moody 
and and ask her I, her opinion on thank it. Thank you so. so much, and I thank you all for being here. I did not use a name. I know, but but it's hard. I know. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Jordan. Uh, we have Jade uh, Sadow Zawowski. Did I? Zawowski. Close. Okay. I'm glad I don't have to talk like an auctioneer now. <laughs> As someone who is injured by a vaccine, I firmly believe individuals should have the right to make their own medical choices. Nobody should be forced by mandate to submit to medical procedures nor discriminate against for their medical choices. Many of us felt confident in our decision to receive these vaccines until we experienced the dev devastation of a vaccine injury. Sometimes the realization that a certain disease or disorder was caused by a vaccine occurs year after the injury, injury takes place, making it impossible for someone to get a medical exemption. And because of this controversy surrounding vaccines, many doctors won't even entertain the idea of giving an exemption, even if the injury did occur immediately. We have all witnessed unprecedented governmental overreach during this pandemic. Personal medical freedom is an urgent and important issue that cannot be ignored. Because I have been injured by a vaccine, my children are genetically more likely to suffer adverse side effects and injuries. Who will take responsibility if they are injured? If the responsibility lands on us, then the choice must also land on us. Your choice to support medical freedom makes you a defender for children like mine. As their mother, I ask you to take that role seriously and remember them as you vote yes for freedom. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Now we have uh, Cynthia Eams with the Florida Freedom Keepers. You guys are out here in force. Where's your shirt? <laughs> I see the yellow, but where's your shirt? Thank you for today. As a mental health counselor, licensed mental health counselor, I'm seeing a tremendous increase in anxiety and depression, especially as clients attempt to navigate these mandates. In the U.S., substance abuse and suicides continue to skyrocket to escape disconnect and loss of hope. Immigrants escaping their situation are risking life and limb to flock to our beloved America that will no longer exist if choice and free will are obliterated, at least for our citizens. It seems barbarous for humans to have to sacrifice their values and personal health choices to keep a job and food on their table. Why are government leaders and pharmaceutical companies exempt from liability and the very injections that are mandating us while we are expected to submit and assume all the risk, including no disability or insurance coverage, should we be killed or injured? We can't possibly make an informed decision for the proprietary secret ingredients that are in the EUA vaccines that we're st as we're still receiving the FDA, we're not receiving the FDA approved community for another year. It won't be available for another year. I'm counting on you to advocate for choice in medical transparency and against all vaccine passports in both government and private sectors. Please help us. We have to stop this now or they'll be coming for our children next on the slippery mandate slope. Every life is precious. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Cynthia, and you are so correct. Uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine Puckett, she is also with the Florida Freedom Keepers. Is she, is Catherine here once, twice? Uh, her information is in the package and it is also along the same, um, are you Catherine? Oh, no. Um, her, her information is in the package, so, and it's also along the same lines as the previous speakers have spoken. Uh, Seth uh, Tidell? Where's your shirt? I just joined five minutes ago. Ah. <laughs> so I'm a pastor here uh, with Sun Tree Grace Brethren Church. And um, Romans 13 states that you guys have been placed there by God and for God. And God is going to hold us all accountable by how we, uh, we treat what he stewarded us. And I want to support you guys in any way. And we pray for you guys daily. Uh, the, God has established four spheres of government, civil, church, family, and self-government. The problem comes when government steps out of its intended circle, just like a fire is useful in a boundary. When it's outside, it can be destructive. Uh, as lesser magistrates, I want you guys to stand in the gap for our constitutional, medical, and God-given freedoms when the higher-ranking authorities make unjust or arbitrary rules or policies. And I believe this is happening. Uh, the state does not have the authority to order how church will worship or how we govern our homes or bodies. I'd also like to request that our cities counties become a sanctuary for the unborn. Uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness means nothing at all if it doesn't include all people, including the unborn. Before any argument happens, we have to first understand what is it that we're killing? And uh, the science of embryology is clear, scripture is clear, our own consciences are clear. We know what we're killing. From the moment of conception, the unborn is a living whole human being deserving of our protection. And uh, I believe God will hold us responsible for that. 
Ronald Reagan used that quote, if, if I'm hunting and see a movement in the bo bush, I'm not going to shoot unless I know what it is. It might be an animal, it might be a fellow hunter. We need to know what it is we're killing before we have any other arguments. Great. Um, thank, thank, thank you, you. Seth, and very well said. Thank you. Uh, next, we have John Weiler with uh, speaking as an individual. We know you're an individual. <laughs> Actually, I'm speaking for a bunch of cons constituents that are in District 2 of uh, Brevard County. Uh, whoop, I'll get that right. Uh, the current immigration crisis at the southern border is creating a massive influx of illegal immigrants, many of whom are being transported right here to Florida. I'm requesting that the delegation submit bills for the 2021 session that will require Florida employers to use the federal E-Verify system. I'm specifically requesting that one member of the Brevard House delegation submit a bill and one member of the Brevard Senate delegation submit a companion bill requiring E-Verify for all Florida employers. These bills would support the governor and his new public safety director to enforce illegal immigration uh, restrictions. As the quantity of electric motor vehicles multiply and use our road systems at an ever-increasing rate, uh, a method for them to support creation and maintenance of the Florida road network is required. Currently, we all pay 42 cents a gallon at the pump uh, for uh, tax on our road. Uh, legislation is recommended that will tax electric motor vehicles at an equivalent rate. Florida regulation should be established that requires all public and commercial charging facilities be equipped to meter the charge delivered and with the ability to tax the vehicle being charged per kilowatt hour. The recommended rate should be $6.80 for 100 kilowatts. For a 20-gallon fill-up right now, you pay $8.40 on a regular vehicle. Any questions? One thing. Yes. Um, yes. I appreciate your comments on both, um, but especially on the E-Verify. I sponsored such a bill a few yeah. years ago. There were no exceptions. It would have been the most comprehensive and strongest E-Verify bill in, in the nation. I didn't even get a hearing. That was in a Republican House and Senate. We need to do more, especially now, given the influx that we have. Thank you. Yeah, it's, if we had done it two years ago, the yes. place would, it would already be in place. And, and I spoke at this delegation meeting two years ago on the same issue, and you made a similar yeah. comment. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate that, uh, Representative Altman. But it is vital that we do this right now. We, we're we're going to be overrun as a state. And someone asked me the other day, he said, well, well, what good would that do? Well, if you can't get a job, because you have to be verified that you're a citizen or a green card holder or authorized, well, then you're probably going to move somewhere else. Maybe you'll go to New York or New Jersey where they wanted all this and we wouldn't be burdened with it. Okay? Great. Thank you very much, John. Do you have? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Angie Hart Hartfield. Angie, is she available? Is there anyone else in the overflow room that was going to that's on this agenda to speak? Do we know, Kelly? We've invited everybody from the second hand virtual speakers to come down. Okay. 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 Uh, Angie has uh, she does have a tab and so um, it was uh, it was discussing family reunification. So uh, members that is in there. Um, okay, next we are going to go uh, and then we start over on, on tab one because we ran out. Um, Andrew uh, Chevelle with the Florida Voice of the Unborn. Good evening. As the Executive Director of Florida Voice for the Unborn, my message to you all today is a simple one. In 2022, you must pass a Texas-style heartbeat law that will protect Florida's unborn children who have a detectable heartbeat. Volusia County State Representative Webster Barnaby recently filed House Bill 167, the Florida Heartbeat Act, which is an important step in the right direction. The final version of this legislation, when passed, must not provide for any exceptions other than to save the life of the mother. And the final bill must include the novel civil enforcement remedies that the Texas Heartbeat Law so wisely provides. The Texas Heartbeat Act is currently saving hundreds and hundreds of preborn lives every day in the Lone Star State, up to 2,800 so far since September 1st. 
We can do the same here in our Sunshine State, but to do so, all of you pro-life legislators here need to be more committed to saving these defenseless babies than your pro-abortion colleagues are to seeing them murdered. Pass a Texas-style heartbeat law in 2022. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we have Joshua Gat uh, Gattel with the Space Coast Young, hey, hey. Young Republicans. Thank you so much. And thank you to Tyler Soroy and uh, Representative Randy Fine for introducing the partisan and uh, voter information bill. It's really a bill that decreases the influence of outside parties that are not here locally. I've grown up here as a 29 year citizen of Brevard County. I voted in Brevard County. Everyone knows these elections have sides and you get a red card or a blue card depending on what side you're on. These outside forces come in, they drop off the cards, and everybody knows. It comes down to who has the most outside money, not who the best person for the voters is. And I wanna thank you for taking a stand on this and ask you to go one additional step. We need to have primaries. We need to make sure that when we have these city council elections, we look at Melbourne, we look at several other elections where we've had people win with 25% of the vote. Is that really someone that speaks on behalf with a mandate uh, from the people? We need to go that one step further next time around and on our city level, pass petitions or pass legislation to ensure that partisan elections would also have primaries so that we can have true champions representing Brevard citizens. Again, thank you so much on behalf of the Space Coast Young Republicans. We try to be the action arm of the Republican Party and get stuff done for our local citizens. And thank you for helping us get stuff done here at this meeting. Great. Thank, thank you, you, Joshua. And you're referring to the local bill that we just passed. Both the on local the bill from Representative Randy Fine and Tyler Soroy's bill on the school board partisan elections. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have uh, Maria Rogerson with the Space Coast Young Republicans. Welcome. Hello. Unfortunately, Marie was unable to make it today. I didn't so. think you looked like Marie. No, I know. Um, but my name is Amanda Davis, and I'll be speaking on her behalf. Um, I'm actually the assistant treasurer with Space Coast Young Republicans. And I wanted to echo what Josiah said and um, say thank you for passing the voter information bill. It'll definitely provide um, our voters in Brevard County with um, information they need to have well-informed votes. And it's a much appreciated first step. Um, in the process that we plan on continuing with the city of Melbourne. And our hope is that the Charter Amendment will encourage voters to get out there and vote and participate in you know, their amendment rights of you know, being able to elect their elected officials and have the information they needed to do so and also provide a more informed electorate. So I will hand back my time, but thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next we have uh, um, is it Mr. Sullivan with Sullivan Law. Laura Sullivan, you're number four on the agenda, not here. Okay, we'll come back if they happen to come in. Tony Ray with the Florida Death and Dig with Dignity. Good afternoon and thank you for your time. <clears throat> Only having a few minutes to speak, I had to sort of decide what I wanted to say to you. Do I tell you about the many phone calls and emails I've received from people with terminal illnesses that who are desperate to have their right of self-determination at the end of their life, or a contact from family members who have watched a loved one die a long, painful death. Florida needs a medical aid in dying law. Florida has the nation's largest senior population. Cancer is the number one uh, cause of death in Florida. Many hospice nurses and doctors will tell you that they have witnessed deaths that they wish that they could forget. Uh, Many of these are from cancers. Why should the state of Florida mandate that a person with a terminal illness endure the pain and loss of dignity until their last breath? Or do I tell you about how the opponents of aid in dying for decades have promoted the fears of a slippery slope, that the elderly, the disabled, the disenfranchised would be taken advantage of? With 50 years of cumulative data, the laws of the of, uh, States across the nation have shown that the, the existing laws are safe. There's never been a case of abuse or coercion. I would simply ask that you review the packet of information that we've given to you and that I will contact your office 
to see if we can continue this conversation. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Tony. Next, we have David Newman with the Florida Federation of Young Republicans. Hey, David. Good to see you again. Good to see you all, too. Hey there, everybody. My name is David Newman. I'm the treasurer of the Florida Federation of Young Republicans, as well as the vice president of the Space Coast Young Republicans. I'm actually here to say thank you. Uh, we're very grateful for what you did with that local bill earlier on election information. Uh, to kind of put into context just how important that was, young people who have you know families, working families, um, you know single mothers, individuals like that, when they're going to vote for you all, you know they're able to see you know Republican, Democrat. They know particularly where their values lie. Unfortunately when it comes down to those local you know, levels, say like a city election, they usually go into the voting booth, they'll go and vote their best, try to do what they can, but then they'll get confused and lost because they're so busy. They're so busy trying to figure out their everyday lives that they don't have the opportunity to go through all 20 different you know, NPA non-listed spots. So what you did was extraordinarily important for allowing voters who normally drop off to experience the full amount of the election, allow their voices to be heard. So you know, thank you so much, uh, Debbie. We really appreciate Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much, Tyler, Thad, and then Randy, who allowed us to uh, push this forward. I know that this has been something that's been talked about previously, but this meant a lot to us that you heard us out, you brought this forward, and that um, this was able to get passed. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, and next we have Mr. Foe. With, he's a private citizen. F-O-Y. Mr. Foe. F-O-Y. Okay. Members, his, he is under number seven is the tab. And he wanted to talk about the importance of medical freedom, which is so, so noted. Uh, next, we have Vicki Impoco, um, constituent. Vicki, you are, is Vicki here? She is under number eight. And she wanted to speak about women's issues. Um, if Vicki happens to come in, we will, uh, we will go back to both of them. Uh, Ginger Heights with, um, doesn't say what she wanted to speak about. Hey, Ginger. Hi. She's going to tell us. I'm I'll sure. tell you. During my time when I was a practicing chiropractor, one of the most important things that I did was give informed consent about the treatment I offered to the patient, and then I let them decide. I could not force medical treatment. Today, we have the President of the United States that's forcing medical treatment on the citizens. And having them choose between a gene therapy that some call a vaccination or their jobs. He has no constitutional authority to do so. I looked. I can't find it. But you have the constitutional authority to protect our individual rights. And Anne Ryan once said, the smallest minority is the individual. And those who do not protect the individual do not protect the minority. The Constitution outlines specific and limited responsibilities of the federal government, but it also shows that the states created the federal government. So you guys can overrule this. And I know you're working on it. Places like Northrop Grumman, among other businesses, are being pressured by the executive branch to be the enforcer of an unconstitutional executive order. If we do not have bodily autonomy, we are not free. We are slaves. Ezra Taft Benson, the 15th United States Secretary of Agriculture, once said, the Constitution will not be saved in Washington, D.C. It will be saved by the citizens of this nation who love and cherish freedom. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and a physician, said this, unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize into an undercover dictatorship to restrict the art of healing to one class of men and deny equal privileges to the others. That time is now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So eloquently said to Ginger. Um, okay. Next, we have Jessica Reagan with the people of Florida. Hello, I'm here to voice my opinion as well as be the voice of several Brevard County residents that aren't able to attend. I would like to address two issues. Number one, vaccine mandates. Um, I'm a physician assistant. I work in psychiatry. I see kids all day long. Randy Fine said that kids suffer. They are suffering. Uh, you were epic standing up to the school board. Um, I love that. And so December 1st, no jab, no job. That's what I'm facing. Federal laws, we can't have the federal laws over the state laws. We want you to have more power. We want to empower you. We need you to stand back up. If you did something two years ago, redo it now. Because now is a different time. 
we're awakening, we're seeing, and we need you, and we'll be behind you. Um, so that's the vaccine mandates. Number two, we need to know for sure our elections are good, okay? We need to know that. I need to know that. I didn't want marijuana, legal marijuana, in that past. $15 an hour minimum wage is gonna do a lot of harm in that past. Like, I wonder, really, was that us, the people? Or were there other things that were going on? So I need to see integrity in our elections. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Jessica. And uh, I, I, um, I do agree. The federal government has done a, a great overreach of their authority. As Ginger had indicated uh, uh, earlier, we created them, but I think they have forgotten who created them. And, and unfortunately, it has gone, it has gone um, so long now that it's hard to, to bring it back. But we are, bring, we are working on bringing Thank it you. back. And we need to And I do never that. realized that before. Never, never saw it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mrs. Caldwell? Uh, Marion. Mayor, like Karen with an Oh, Mayor. <laughs> Mayor. You have your shirt on. Yes, I didn't put it. I don't know. Why. Okay. But yes, I'm a Florida Freedom Keeper as well. And I have been doing activism for over 20 years, and I fight for medical freedom, religious freedom. And I'm here today to give a brief little synopsis of my history with being vaccine injured. Event 201 in the global pandemic has been used to create fear in order to push the mandatory vaccine agenda for a virus that has a 99% recovery rate. When I was a child, my mom followed the CDC schedule, resulting in me having high fevers for days, unable to lift my arm, and it had to be placed in a sling. The vaccines altered my natural immune system, causing me to become hypersensitive to many things. I had severe reactions, which created panic attacks, chronic cough, asthma, resulting in multiple trips to the hospital by ambulance. My conditions began to worsen when I developed hives, swelling, and my throat started to close. I went to multiple doctors who were clueless about my declining health. However, my asthma specialist helped rehabilitate my breathing by showing me exercises and various techniques to strengthen my lungs and prescribe me an inhaler. I am already a victim of the corrupt medical and pharmaceutical industry, and I am, that is why I'm here to fight for medical freedom and religious freedom and parental choice. Also, with that being said, it is never a one-size-fits-all. And Congressman Posey, we have spoken with him. He is an amazing resource on his experience and what he's uh, dealt with the CDC as well. And as far as the school board being addressed this evening, as a mother, a former educator for BPS, a child who is struggling, I am so grateful that you are holding them accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Next we have Bill Williams with the film, Florida. Hey, great to see you again. Good to see you. Well, Film Florida is supportive of the film incentives that have been presented in the past. And as uh, Stacy Hawkins-Smith said, there's a support actively given for the arts. Well, motion picture and entertainment production is an art form, and it receives virtually no support from the state, though there are some special exemptions made for some tax relief. Uh, last year, there was a bill proposed that, thank you, Senator Wright, for helping that through committee, um, and it made it through one of six committees uh, that it could have gone through, and that's all it did. Uh, a similar bill is being proposed this year. I don't know the details of it, uh, but it is something that, again, Film Florida is supporting. One of the things that was done last year is resolve a lot of the questions that had occurred in previous years on that bill, uh, including its uh, scoring, its return on investment scoring that the legislature has to do. And we got a slight positive number. It's not great, but it's positive. And what I'm asking for is that we give it a shot this year and see if this works. Um, we're up against a lot of competition, and if we can get something that works, then maybe we can build on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, next, we have Honey Smith Walls with the Concerned Residents. Good evening, one and all, distinguished panel. I'm here as a concerned resident in uh, Brevard County, and at this older age, I was raised in a different state and culture. I'm here to defend some other mother's child from fearful hearts of adults. My name is Honey Smith Walls and I live about five miles down the road. 
in Melbourne. I'm a business owner. My child is now 45. He did used to go to Satellite High. And uh, he went into the Navy and married another seaman, now has uh, a great job at Ford in IT, and she got her GI Bill and became a nurse, is now a corporate nurse. And they gave me four children. I would be here defending any of their right to feel whoever and however they feel inside, and still be able to participate in the functions that our school system provides to teach our children. And I would just ask, respectfully, I would urge you to oppose the decisions that spotlight and target children and crush their little spirits, keep them from the joys and jewels of teamwork, which are far more important, their little spirits, than those restrictions. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, honey. Next, we have Laura, Laura Cobb. Laura is another concerned constituent. Is Laura here? Okay, we will um, come back if she comes into the room. Uh, Diane Conaway with the League of Women Voters of the Space Coast. Welcome, Diane. Thank you so much. Good evening to Good all evening. of you. Thank you for what you do. I appreciate everything you do. Uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political group. Our main purpose is to make sure every single person is registered to vote. And we will start voter registration very shortly. In fact, we will be holding uh, a candidate forum for Cape Canaveral, and it will be on Zoom and it will be October 2nd, and that will be available for everybody to view. The League has legislative priorities every year, and this year, um, the two top ones are gonna make sure everybody votes. We're gonna get everybody out to vote, and I know you'll support us with that. The other thing we will be concentrating on is redistricting. Uh, we wanna make sure that um, fair district standards are adhered to for redistricting. We also want to support public participation, sort of, you know, what we're doing here tonight, so that everybody does have a little bit of a say. Thank you again for what you do. Good night. Thank you, Diane. And there is a website um, on the Florida Senate. It's a joint Florida Senate and Florida House website related to redistricting that every citizen can go on and, um, and take a look at and put their recommendations in. Um, on it. So uh, if good. you don't have that, we can make sure our staff gets you, uh, gets you that site. Thank you. Okay. I would appreciate that. And we can post it on ours too. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good evening. I think it was actually in the Mayfield Minute this past week, was it not? Mm -hmm. I think so. <laughs> um, next is uh, Bob White, Republican Liberty Caucus. Come on down, Bob. Come on down. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the delegation. I'm not actually here today to request that you vote for or against any particular piece of legislation. We did provide Kaylee with a package for each of you that includes all of our legislative priorities. Uh, what I am here to do is to communicate to you what our expectations are of you. And there's really just one. And that is that you would uphold your oath of office that you took when you placed your hand on the Bible and swore that you would uphold the constitutions of the United States of America and the state of Florida. If you uphold your oath of office, you won't take no for an answer when you tell the Speaker and the Senate President that you want constitutional carry heard and passed, and that you want legislation repealing red flag law and restoring the gun rights of 18, 19, and 20-year-olds to also be heard and passed. If you uphold your oath of office, you will tell leadership that the one individual, one vote principle is the foundation upon which our constitutional republic is built, and you want legislation calling for a forensic audit of the 2020 election to be heard and passed. And if you uphold your oath of office, you will support medical freedom and parental rights by passing legislation banning government at every level from instituting mask and vaccine mandates. And in closing, I just do want to echo all of the comments that were made by the, uh, the folks from Florida Freedom Keepers regarding uh, Florida Statute 381. That statute is a wreck, and it needs to be completely overhauled. 
Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, okay, next we have Lamar with the We the People of Indian River County. Traveled a long way. Um, and next then we have Diane um, Mazayer. Anyway, if, if you guys can look, we're, can, you have your agenda, so if you will just please be on deck whenever we're ready. Sorry, I think you caught me sleeping. I did. <laughs> Waving my flag too much. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm in agreement totally with Freedom Keepers and, and uh, Bob White and Republican Liberty Caucus. And thank you, uh, Senator Mayfield, for your takedown of the school board um, who was not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but my issue here is um, that medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death in the United States, at least since 2004. How can that be when we've got one of the most sophisticated medical systems in the world? I've experienced the deaths of three friends recently in the past month at the hospital, not at home, but at the hospital. So they, they say it's from COVID, but we know that it's not. Um, and I would encourage all of you, um, I, I sent you an email, Senator Mayfield, um, I didn't know who else was going to be here, but um, I do have some extra papers that I can give you um, asking you to do just that. Um, what if there was a cure for COVID? There actually are several cures for COVID, but um, we're not allowed to do that. So I'm asking you to sponsor legislation first, do no harm, to protect patients from medical tyranny and medical malpractice. I've got friends who should still be alive today. And so I encourage you to uphold uh, patient rights and to hold hospitals liable and to uh, require, require them to pay for autopsies because most uh, family members cannot afford to pay for autopsies. And so um, we need to know why they're dying. It's not from COVID, it's from medical malpractice. Great, thank you, Lamar. Uh, next we have uh, Dinah, is that? Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and delegation members. My name is Dina Meza. I am a member of the Zanta Club of Melbourne. Zanta is an international organization whose objective is to raise the status of women worldwide. Our Melbourne chapter began in 1983. However, Zanta dates back to 1919 when it was founded by a group of people, including Amelia Earhart. Zanta is derived from the Native American word, meaning honest and trustworthy. Since our start in Brevard, we have financially and physically supported local domestic violence shelters and residents through donations, physical labor, and a multitude of scholarships. Zanta's priorities include advancing public policies, promoting women's equality and well being. Women's empowerment has positive effects lower domestic violence rates, greater rates of women earning advanced degrees and owning businesses, resulting in better care and education for children when their mothers are financially independent. We are asking you to support women empowerment through ratification of the Federal Rights Amendment, which is pending in the Senate. The Equal Rights Amendment simply needs a positive vote in the Senate to be added to our federal constitution. Doing so would then bring the federal constitution on par with the Florida Constitution. Last legislative session, bills to ratify the ERA were introduced in the Florida House and Senate but did not come up for a vote. I urge you to use your legislative powers to bring the ERA up for a vote. Please consider these thoughts when the ERA comes before you and acknowledge that women deserve constitutional protection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Peter with Election Integrity of Bavard Republican Executive Committee. Peter, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Peter Anselmo, and I'm here with Breck to urge you to advocate and ensure an official canvas of the voter rolls in this state. Necessary to safeguard the integrity of government and understand the results of the 2020 and future elections. Defend Florida, a grassroots citizen group, has been canvassing. They have actually done 10,953 canvas attempts. Uh, their data shows 53% are verified registrants. 33% are ghost registrants. That is, they're either deceased, don't live at the address, or the address is not a residence. Uh, 
Most troubling, though, is the 14% who were phantom voters. That is, they're deceased, they did not live at the residence, or the residence is, the, the address is not a residence. Now, if we extrapolate the 14% statewide, we'd be talking about a million five hundred and sixty two hundred and eighty three voters who are ineligible to vote. We urge you and your colleagues to require and undertake an official canvas to purge the roles of ineligible voters. The Constitution makes you responsible for electoral process. Free and fair elections should not be a partisan issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Next, we have Adrienne Davison with the Bavard Republican Executive Committee. Hello. I'm also here representing the Bavard Republican Executive Committee. Um, continuing on with Peter's points, um, we just want to definitely appreciate and want to thank you all for um, all the hard work you did on the um, Senate Bill 90, getting that passed. That legislation does not go far enough, however, um, in addressing the real issue, the nonpartisan problem that we have. Uh, the real problem is a crisis of trust in our election voting system. Many voters are saying now, why go vote in an election? It's not even worth it. It's all rigged. The only way to solve this problem is to support and pass House Bill 99. HB 99 requires our governor to appoint an independent third party to conduct a forensic audit of the 2020 general election in every Florida county with a population of 250,000 or more. We are requesting our Brevard senators immediately file a companion bill to House Bill 99. I have submitted supporting documents of data analysis, statistical analysis, and canvassing results that prove election fraud in Brevard County and other Florida counties. <clears throat> Florida's Voter Bill of Rights states that each registered voter in the state of Florida has the right to vote and have his or her vote accurately counted. Without trust in the voting system, our representative constitutional republic is gone. We are, res we are respectively requesting the full support of the state legislators to get HB 99 passed and signed by our governor. You are our last hope to protect our vote. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, next, we have Sarah. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. I'm Sarah Mursky, college student, mom, and married to a husband who is in the commercial space industry. My family has experienced vaccine injuries and have suffered damages with mask mandates, both physically and mentally. Physical and mental health are equally important. My family and I have been able to heal our bodies through alternative treatments, including but not limited, limited to stage three breast cancer, debilitating migraines, flu and the common cold, we are grateful we could choose the right treatment path for our health. One size does not fit all, and I'm requesting that you support or write legislation for informed consent, bodily autonomy, and ban mask and vaccine mandates. Floridians are suffering and stressed out and shouldn't have to live in fear of losing their health, careers, and livelihoods over something that has zero liability. Floridians need protection from our legislature. And I just want to say thank you so much. I have two children in the public school system here. Thank you so much for holding our public school system accountable. Thank you. Okay, next we have Megan with the uh, private constituent. Megan, are you here? Hitchner? Megan Hitchner? Okay, if she comes in, we will also uh, go back to her. And she wanted to talk about House Bill 6009. Uh, next, we have Heather, who is also a, here as an individual, and you're going to speak about election integrity, Second Amendment, and medical freedom. I'm so grateful to live in Florida. You guys are awesome, and thank you for listening to us. So, so much of what um, I'm saying is just echoing, so it's just kind of redundant, but um, the health officer can order you, know, you to be forcibly have a medical um, <laughs> treatment that, yeah, I just hope that law can get changed. So the other thing I wanted to say is why did the WHO change the definition of immunity? They took off any uh, wording that has natural immunity off their website. So they're not even looking at anybody that may have recovered from COVID. 
um, that has natural immunity. Um, and the Nuremberg Code number one, um, the voluntary consent of human subject is absolutely essential. And um, so how is the threat of losing your job voluntary? Um, I just uh, applaud you for defending us in that way and that you guys are um, standing between us and the federal government. So you guys trump uh, the federal government. The other thing is uh, election integrity. So we need regular randomized forensic audits in Florida. Um, Sen uh, Senator Wendy Rogers in Arizona is setting the standard for forensic audits. Um, in May, an executive order was issued, and I paraphrase, we must improve efforts to identify, deter, and protect against cyber attacks. We must carefully examine what occurred during any major cyber incident and apply lessons learned. So we need regular randomized forensic audits and canvassing. Great. Thank so, you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, next we have Sherry Avery. Hello. <clears throat> um, it is important for me and my family to keep our medical freedom because I know what is best for my family and for our bodies. Many of us need you to stand up against others to protect our jobs and livelihood. Numerous bills have been introduced already that I beg you to invest in and support. A few are HB 75, which prohibits state from enacting masks or vaccine mandates. HB 6009 removes authority of state house officer to order vaccinations of individuals upon declaration of public health emergency. No one should be forced to do something to their body that they do not agree with. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sherry, thank you very much. I was just advised that uh, we need about a five minute recess to reset the cameras in order for the recording to go on and in order for the live streaming to take place. So we're gonna take a five minute recess that will allow us to also maybe go to the restroom. And uh, so I would ask that you guys all be back here so we can get started. The good news is that we are ahead of schedule so uh, I thank you guys for that as well, and let's just keep it, keep it going. So five minute recess.
This, oh, am I coming now? Okay, I guess they cut me on. Is what they did. Okay, we'll get. We're gonna get back. Um, and I believe. Let me get myself organized back here. Um, Sherry was, and we're live again. Sherry was our last speaker, if I'm not mistaken. And now we're up to Gary um, Pansy. P Gary, are you here? Come on down. And after Gary, we have Nancy Reisner with Bavard County Citizen. And then if you guys would continue to line up as you have done in the past, that would be greatly appreciated. Which number? 26. Fellow Floridians, on June 7th, 2021, Governor DeSantis signed HB 7017 and HB 1523, which prote protect Florida higher education and government from foreign influence and also combat against corporate espionage, protect intellectual property. At that day, Governor DeSantis said, China is a hostile foreign power and government has a responsibility to protect its citizens. This bill encourages, this bill, uh, this bill 
uh, censures foreign adversaries, and they will not uh, have unfettered access to our schools, government, and corp uh, corporations. Lieutenant Government Gover uh, Governor Nunez also applauded. This puts an end to foreign bad actors infiltrating our state and holds criminals liable who actually steal and trade our trade secrets and in intellectual property. Senate President Simpson said, yes, we should do everything we can as a state to protect our citizens from undue foreign influence and from those who seek to harm our country and our way of life. For Floridians, the Chinese Communist Party has only the most malicious of intentions against our country. For instance, they seek to control the internet and the media. They use bribery and money, money influence. They use seduction and honey traps. And they're trying to foment weakness, chaos, and destruction such as calling human rights, freedom of belief, and free speech, Western bourgeois values. I myself have experienced this. Uh, not only did I receive computer viruses for five years because I talk about this publicly, but I have a good friend who was a English teacher in China. When she brought the Declaration of Independence into her college English class, she was arrested. The students were interrogated, and she was sent to a labor camp for brainwashing. At the start of a hunger strike, they tied her down and force fed her. She got out in 06. Senator, uh, Speaker Sprouls of our legislature said that Florida is at the forefront of rooting out Chinese espionage efforts and that have resulted in the blatant theft of our state's intellectual property and research. He was seconded by Senators Mike Beltram and Manny Diaz. And Beltram said, American ingenuity is second to none. Think of that, Floridians. Say it loudly. American ingenuity is second to none. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, and our Florida legislative delegation for passing this historic law. Law, please support him and stay focused on this central issue. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you, Gary, so much. Uh, Nancy Reisner with the Bavard, Bavard Concerned. Freedom Keepers. <laughs> I'm here today to urge you to act on legislation that protects and defends medical freedom and freedom of choice in Florida. First, remove, remove the forced quarantine and forced vaccination language that exists in current Florida statute 381 section 315, including the very disturbing language in this statute which states by any means necessary. This type of government overreach into private and free people's lives should not exist in law and should never exist in a free society. Please fix this statute and amend it. Second, add medical status to anti-discrimination statute as a protected class alongside gender, race, religion, etc. As we speak today, Brevard County has de deemed a portion of its quote-unquote essential staff ineligible for a monetary incentive based solely on that individual's personal medical choice surrounding these shots. How can an employee be less quote-unquote essential based on a private health decision? This is medical discrimination and it is happening in some form all over Florida. We do not create second class citizens in this country. We are not more or less equal based on our personal medical choices. This inequity must be addressed. Medical discrimination has no place in a free society. We the people are guaranteed the right to bodily autonomy in the US and state constitution. Our expectation is, and hope is that you will act to protect and defend the constitutional rights for all Floridians and keep Florida free. Thank you for your time and attention. Great, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Ma Madam Chairman, oh, may oh. I just have a personal point of Absolutely. privilege here? I'm gonna be brief. I've been doing this now for over 25 years. I just wanna say I love the flags. I, I have never been to a public hearing and like I said, over 25 years, to show such, a, show such a moving and classy way of supporting speakers. It's just touching for me, and I just want to thank you for that. I would have waited to the end of the meeting, but I was afraid everyone would be gone. But I've never seen it. It's cool. You probably can't see it on the TV, but we have a ton of people. When somebody speaks and they agree, they wave, wave a U.S. flag. It's, it's moving. Thank you. And on that note, I will share. Uh, we have about, um, I think I had... The number of speakers that we have left at one and a half minutes, we are going to be running over seven o'clock because of the five minute break or so that we had to take. So we're going to have to speed it up just a little bit more in order to get through by seven o'clock. So you guys have done a great job, but we get, we're going to have to speed it up. So Chandler, uh, you, you're right on cue there, Chandler. Thank you. 
get a little taller. All right. Good evening, delegation. Thank you for having me today. My name is Chandler Langevin. I am Republican candidate for House District 52 and a proud citizen of the city of Melbourne. I am also the president and founder of a gun rights organization called Protect the Second, and that's what I initially was going to come here to talk about tonight was how Florida actually has some of the worst gun laws of any Republican-dominated state. But I'm also a proud sailor in the United States Navy, and I'm going through something right now because of my personal beliefs and convictions that I am actually having to choose now between taking an experimental vaccine or being forced out of the Navy. Now, that is a purely federal issue, so there's nothing you can do about it as a delegation, but it breaks my heart when I hear nurses, doctors, our firefighters, the best of Floridians losing their jobs, getting forced to choose between their children, their families, or a con personal conviction that I'm personally going through as well. Um, and uh, Senator Debbie, you did say we have the governor is doing things, the judiciary is doing things. The power resides in the legislator. The legislator needs to take on this issue. We need to have a special session. My good friend and mentor, Anthony Sabatini, has been calling for a special session. I would like to see us go into one. It should have happened two months ago. It needs to happen now. I would just like to share a quote from Alexander Hamilton before I finish. He said, even though he was the most pro-federalist of all of our founding fathers, he said, the state legislators should be guardians of their citizens' rights. And I would ask that you do the same. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Chandler. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, we did pass legislation last year that said that there was not going to be a vaccine mandate or a, or a um, mass mandate. So we are, those are challenges that we are going through because some people are not listening to us. So um, that's why the challenge through the courts are taking place uh, right now. So thank you, though. I, you're, you're right on. Uh, Denise, come on down. A family member of mine was diagnosed with Hashimoto's and her doctor wanted to immediately put her on medication, possibly surgery, and even more medication that she would be reliant on for the rest of her life. Luckily, she got a second opinion because it turns out she didn't have Hashimoto's. Her doctor just read the results wrong. Whoops. As a young mother, I eagerly followed the advice of the CDC, vaccinated my children on schedule, and didn't question them. At the time, I did not even believe that vaccine injury was a real thing. I thought it was just something that uneducated hippie moms who didn't understand science had made up. Then it happened to my child. It turns out that one-size-fits-all medicine doesn't always work. Oops. Sometimes we forget that our experts are still just humans and humans make mistakes. Sadly, I've learned that when these mistakes happen in healthcare, the responsibility to pick up the pieces lands on the victims and their families, not the people who cause the harm. This is why medical freedom is so crucial. If the responsibility lands on us, then the choice must also land on us. Please let the free people of this country decide which risk we're willing to take. Every aspect of life comes with risks. We understand that, but the choice needs to be ours. We need immediate legislation to protect our citizens from being forced into any medical procedure they don't want. So many of us campaigned for all of you sitting up here right now, and um, we were happy to support you, and we just ask that you please support us too with our basic medical freedoms. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Regina Osgood with Space Coast uh, Equality. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody. Let me take the mask off. I'm here to represent the LBGTQI plus Space Coast Equality, Equality Florida, and myself. Being me is not a choice. I've been through 30 some years of therapy. I know who I am. We have some awesome things occurring here in the state of Florida. I am so proud of the fact that there's money being put into the Indian River Lagoon and all that. That's fantastic and the work that you've all done in that. The fact that we have a new satellite facility coming in that's gonna bring a whole lot more workers and Brightline. Oh my goodness, what a fantastic thing that is. Those are going to bring in more of me, the LBGT QI+. I wonder if you know what it's like for me to go to a medical doctor and to be told, oh, I don't know how to treat you. I can't treat you. You have to find somebody else. That's sad. 
We're in 2021. I exist. There's proof that I exist. And I'm sorry. If I can help you, please contact me. Have a nice day. Great. Thank you, Regina, for your testimony. Jody Hand with Moms for Liberty. Uh, she is under 30, tab 31. Jody, you're here. It indicated that you weren't going to speak, but I'm glad you're here. I'm actually not Jody. Okay. I was going to speak on behalf of her, um, but she didn't send me her speech, so I'm just going to ask a couple questions. My name is Amanda Brandt. Um, I signed in back there. Okay. <sighs> okay. Um, I wasn't prepared to speak, so I'm just going to ask a couple questions. Um, so you said something about uh, the federal government, uh, the states being over the federal government, so that we should have the um, opportunity to negate anything that they try and do in our state. Um, so I'm part of Florida Freedom Keepers, and last legislative session, it felt like pulling teeth trying to get uh, legislators to listen to us and our concerns about as uh, 381.003.15 the forced vaccine law um, I was just wondering why was that kept because all eyes were on it every legislator should have been aware of it and um, concerned about it so just wondering why that was kept um, and why are Floridians continuously begging for our basic rights, like what we do or don't put into our body? Um, also, does the Constitution apply to U.S. citizens? Um, it applies to Americans, but does it apply to U.S. citizens? And the last question I have, which is what got me into all of this, is do we own our children? Do we own our children as U.S. citizens? Um, so far, my the answer I found is no. So that's just, I guess, what I have. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Next, we have Richard Webb. A question? No, I, I would ask her, um, Regina, if you, she could give us those questions in writing Amanda. or just a note so we can put them in our, our uh, write them in on your yeah. yeah. If you can give me your qu our questions, questions Amanda. Writing, okay. and, and a contact so we can respond to some of those. And you can do that during the course of the meeting. I, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> Richard Webb. Hi. I am Richard Webb. I sent you emails asking to be able to revise and extend my remarks since it was cut down from the original time. Um, my recollection at the last Republican Executive Committee meeting was that uh, Adrian Davidson's uh, resolution asking y'all to uh, do a full forensic audit um, was unanimous. Uh, but I'm here to, to possibly save your life. Deadly remdesivir. You can go on this website. You can look at the evidence. You can click on the links. You can find out how much you have been lied to by the medical establishment and Anthony Fauci. He has a financial interest in remdesivir. It was uh, in the clinical trials, there were five possible outcomes. They took off one during the trials. They changed it and they removed death because they didn't complete the study. You've got to be kidding me. And yet remdesivir is part of what they are doing in the local hospitals as their standard of care. If you've got anybody that are uh, friends and family that are uh, headed to the hospital, look out, remdesivir is a problem. The solution is ivermectin. 231,000 people in India, the whole state has been declared clear because they've been taking ivermectin. I am. Hope you do. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard, for your um, testimony. Uh, Logan uh, Edge. Logan. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you guys so much for having us. I just wanted to kind of speak a little bit. So I'm a very new resident of Florida. I consider myself a political refugee from Georgia. 
I fled after Republicans failed us on the election audit. They failed us during the election, and uh, we still haven't figured out what happened in Fulton County. So it's been great to hear a bunch of citizens here ask about a forensic audit here in Florida as well. And also I'd like to ask, um, over this past year with COVID, we've watched lots of tyranny all around our country. And I think the equalizer between that is the Second Amendment. And I know that constitutional carry has been filed, but I don't know of any updates. So I would just really like to kind of get an update of where we lie in the legislature on constitutional carry as of now. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Logan. Um, Louis Valdez, gun owner of America. I, I want to answer this question yeah, as quickly. Yep. Uh, right where we stand in the process, uh, um, we're in the early phases of uh, bill drafting. Mm -hmm. And once those bills are drafted, they're put into, uh, they're filed, and they become a public record and an officially filed bill. I don't know, I think constitutional carry has been filed. I'll have to look. Um, I don't know if it has a Senate companion yet, but, but you can go to myfloridahouse.com. Okay. It's a wonderful site, mm -hmm. and it gives you, uh, it's probably the best in the nation. Uh, you can do a word search. Mm -hmm. um, we, you can call our office, we'll find out exactly where it is. Um, and find out exactly what the status of any bill related to Second Amendment, or, or you can you can enter certain statutes or word search, and it will fill you in. We really haven't started hearing bills yet, but we will soon. I think we've heard of maybe a few, but we're very early in the process. And then during this fall, mm -hmm. early winter, we'll be in committee meetings, and those bills will be heard. They have to be referenced too, so the process is draft, file. Leadership references the bill, which committees, and then the committee chairs start hearing it. But you can, you can track that on mm -hmm. myfloridahouse.gov and the Senate. We have FL. a Senate, okay. flsenate.gov. Okay, thank you. And it's the same process. And as a reminder, and I know we're, we're going to be running out of time here, um, Representative Altman is correct. We just started committee hearings. Session starts in January. So start following that site now because it is updated. Uh, when bills are filed, mm -hmm. not when they're drafted, but when bills are filed, mm -hmm. then when the bills are referenced, and then the bills as they go through the committee process, you can track it right on the site. Okay. Um, and again, our call the office if there's any particular bill that you would like help on tracking. Our, our off, any of our offices would be happy to help on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Logan. Louis Valdez, gun owner. Gun owners of America. So Louis Valdez couldn't make it. Oh. I'm Timothy Lorette with the Vice President of Protect the Second. Did I'm you fill out member. an appearance card? Yes, ma'am. It's up there. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Louis Valdez is a good friend of mine. But not to sound like a broken record, but I'm also here about constitutional carry. So, I feel blessed to be here, to be able to speak with my legislators, constitutional rights afforded every American. The Second Amendment of the Constitution states that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Currently in the United States, we have New York, Illinois, California, and Florida as the only states that you cannot open carry easily or legally. I think we need to take the approach that Texas took here recently and not only get constitutional carry, uh, but also partial or full NFA nullification. They remove suppressors from the NFA, getting rid of an unconstitutional tax on the rights of Americans, and we need to follow their path. Also, we need to look at restoring the rights that were stripped away from 18, 19, and 20-year-old Floridians. When I was 19 years old, turning 20, I fought in Iraq. I carried an M4. And if I were living in Florida now at 19 or 20, I couldn't even have the semi-automatic version of that, and it's not right. That's all I have to say. Great. Thank you very much for coming and testifying. Uh, Crystal Rogers, is Crystal here? Okay. If Crystal comes in, that we will. She had info under tab 35, and it just talks about topic was on human and um, health and human services. Uh, now we're going to go to 30, tab 36, Jana Schmidt. Jana, are you here? 
Jana is tab 36, and she is also wanting to talk about health and human services, and she's with the AFLDS. Um, Wes Ryan, is Wes Ryan here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then we have Olivia Ems. Uh, good evening, Madam uh, Chair and speakers of the delegation. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm here to urge you to defend uh, medical freedom by preventing uh, vaccine-based uh, discrimination. The federal government mandating vaccines and using a heavy hand to coerce states and the private sector to do the same and encouraging denial of services for unvaccinated is costing us our jobs and even our right to participate in society. Um, our Declaration of Independence asserts that the government's purpose is singular and that was to protect our unalienable uh, God-given rights. James Madison wrote that the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined and he limited those to war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce, and taxation. And force vaccinating me or taking away my liberties if I decline is not a delegated power. Thomas Jefferson noted that whenever the uh, general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. And Madam Chair, just to address one of the things that you had said where the states are under the federal government, our founders would disagree. Uh, Jefferson even said that the states who form the Constitution, being sovereign and independent, have the unquestionable right to judge of its infraction. Um, Madison also said that when the federal government exercises undelegated powers, the states have the right and are duty bound uh, to interpose. And as our representatives, uh, you're duty bound to nullify acts of a tyrant who has stolen authority guaranteed by the Ninth and Tenth Amendments that is supposed to rely with us. Um, We've supported you and we ask for you to support us in return, codify medical freedom in Florida law. When the federal government overreaches, we need to stand up and say no and put them back in their place. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Wes. And let me, I just wanna clarify that because this is probably about the third or fourth person that said that to me. Yeah. I know how our constitution was done. We, the states, created the federal government. Yes. We have let the federal government go a whack over the last several years. Yes. So yes. therefore, what we need to do is bring them back in line. And Absolutely. so some of the stuff that we are doing is we're having to fight that now. Yes. We, we are having to fight a lot of that stuff. The federal government came down and said mandate for vaccine on any business, any business, especially businesses that do work with the federal government. Right. And as you know, most all of our space industry and all of our technology does business with the federal government. I'm now the well federal aware. government is mandating those and they're mandating it through OSHA because OSHA does, you know, that's part of the federal um, government. So I know that Governor DeSantis, we are working hard to make sure that we, that we let the businesses know we are a state. Yes. You don't have to do that. The problem is, is when the federal government cuts those businesses' fundings off, those businesses are going to be hurting. Yeah. So, we, you know, we will continue to fight for that. And I appreciate that. And, and we really are. And so, yeah. you know, that is one of the things that I am sure is going to be a topic of discussion this session because he has already filed a pill on the mass mandates. He has filed a pill. But then we have to fight it because yeah. people are doing what they want to do. Just like I mentioned earlier with the school board, they are not following the rule of the Board of Education on the mass mandates. And it's gonna be the same thing with the mass mandates, it's gonna be the same thing with the vaccine mandates, and we will be fighting it. So I don't want you to think that, that anyone up here is thinking that we're bowing down to the federal government. We are fighting the federal government. I appreciate the best that. We, can. we were not, most of us in this room were not educated that way, which is sad. And I'm glad that you recognize that the proper authority is the state is above the federal government, is the child of the creation of the, of the the state compact exactly. and i thank you for that um and i recognize all that you and governor DeSantis have been doing i just want it codified uh, more of it codified in florida law because the next government uh, governor that comes we are not necessarily guaranteed somebody who's going to fight for our rights like he has and that's a great point and that's one of the things that we will you know i'm sure we're going to be looking at yeah. um, this year but i i want to just express we are so appreciative of everyone that has come out and spoke about this I agree with Representative Altman to have, you have been so considerate. Um, you're waving your flags in support, which is an awesome thing to do. And everyone has been very courteous. 
Uh, and, uh, and I can't thank you guys enough for that, because that really means a lot to us on this delegation that, you, that you're doing that. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your input to everyone on it. So Thank you for your time. Thank you again for being here. Great. Appreciate thank it. you, gonna, Wes. So I know we're yep. running short, but yes, I'll be quick. Yes. Sir. Thank you for bringing this. This is a wonderful outpouring of states' rights. Greatly appreciated. Don't stop. You know, years ago uh, and in the past, when I was in the Senate, Senator, our Senate President Jeff Outwater is a big movement for the Council of States. You speak of the Tenth Amendment, mm -hmm. where states literally have the ability, we feel constitutionally, to call a constitutional uh, convention. In Article Five. And so we, we under Article Five. So we support that, and we need your support. Maybe one day that will become a reality. It's going to require a certain percentage of states, but. Understand. We're with you. Okay. We're with you. Thank you all. And yeah. as a piggyback on that, I think it's going to be sooner than later now because of so. how the federal <laughs> government has been acting. So I think that there may be more of a push, the uproar, not, I mean, just not from Florida or Texas, but all, a lot of the other states are feeling the same way. So that may be a sooner than later um, action that may take place. So Wonderful. Uh, then thank you. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you all. Okay. We have Olivia. Hello. Hey, Olivia. My name is Olivia Eames. I'm 16, and I believe that America is falling. When James Madison wrote the U.S. Constitution, he knew he was giving government the kind of power it would certainly abuse. Power such as printing money, creating executive orders, and of course, making laws. But to protect, these, but to protect our rights, the Constitution grants the people ultimate power. Perhaps our greatest stronghold over government is our ability to vote. And yet, we vote in representatives that give our rights back to the government. Why? In history this year, I have learned that there are four pillars of American prosperity. These are the right to property, freedom of religion, small government, and capitalism. Without just one of these, our country will fall, just like Rome and just like Nazi Germany. It is not in my power to change how my fellow Americans vote. So I ask that, if nothing else, you, our representatives, will uphold and defend our right to property, freedom of religion, small government, and capitalism to your utmost power. And whenever faced with an issue, that you will ask yourselves if you have abused your power. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Olivia, what school do you go to? Oh, I'm homeschooled. I, I figured um, that. <laughs> I'm with Classical Conversations. Thank you. Thank you. And kudos to your mom and dad. Uh, Chris Bird. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm here as the wife of an airline captain whose 22-year career will soon be on the line. Um, I'm here to speak to the devastating impact that unconstitutional and immoral vaccine mandates will have on our state and our families. In New York State, thousands of healthcare workers are losing their jobs this week, causing a healthcare crisis. New York State teachers have until October 1st to get the shot or face one year of unpaid leave, which will cause an educational crisis. Biden may think mandating the shot will force people into compliance, but all it will do is force people into welfare lines. Numerous business sectors will be devastated, as will their employees who have been working all through this pandemic, but now are being fired for choosing to exercise their God-given right to bodily autonomy. The shot is not one size fits all. By now the public is educated enough on their risks to make a personal assessment of whether the shot is right for them. How many already have natural immunity, which is 20 times stronger than the shot and may last a lifetime? My husband has natural immunity. Why must he be forced to choose between his livelihood as the provider for our family and a shot he does not need or want? There's nowhere you can go after having an airline career. Keep Florida free. Don't New York my Florida. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next is Paige Sanchez. Paige. Good evening. Today I'm urging your support for HB 167, which is similar to the Texas heartbeat bill. At just six weeks, a baby has its own unique DNA, a brain, kidneys, a heartbeat, a blood type, facial features, skin, responds to touch, has brain waves, and can feel pain. These are all markers that we use to identify human beings. 
Ultrasounds taken during a DNC abortion during the first trimester reveal as abortion instruments invade the womb, the child rears and moves violently to attempt to avoid the instrument as their heartbeat races, but with nowhere to go and no one to stand up for them. The abortionist suction tip rips the baby's limbs from its body and the head is crushed with forceps because it's too big to be removed. This is heartbreaking and I'm sure hard to hear because it's so graphic. Approximately 700,000 preborn children are killed using this type of abortion every year. My heart is heavy for expectant mothers in difficult situations, but terminating the life of a child is never the solution. There are so many families, churches, and pregnancy centers that provide support to these women, and I'm happy to share what Brevard is doing to support these women as well. Policies that protect abortion are never pro-women or pro-child, as they con lo cause long-lasting harm and trauma. Every human being is created with dignity and worth by our Lord, and we have a duty to protect life. I'm counting on you all to support legislation that values the lives of preborn children and is truly pro-women. If we don't stand up for the voiceless, who will? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paige. Well said. Uh, Emily? <coughs> Hello. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I am a military spouse. My husband, he dreamt of being a helicopter pilot ever since he was seven and he accomplished that dream and now flies for the uh, army reserves and we were very excited about that love that pursuit um, military does have its ups and downs but there has for us also been a mandate of get the jab or lose the job the dream job and for active military that is december 15th for us which are reservists it is june 30th and you know we have talked about the federal overreach that is going on and that we're fighting back against that and this is just a personal story to share that we too are making that battle and right now what we face is a dishonorable discharge which follows you your whole life for over a vaccine that is outrageous um, currently there is what is passed the house um, is HR 4350 where personnel will be released with a honorable discharge but it has just really brought to home, made it personal, this vaccine in our household. And so I wanted to bring forth also my concern and ask that you still please support and develop bills that defend our body autonomy and keep out any overreach. We have have the right to make this choice. Um, if the president could have made his mandate applicable to Congress as opposed to just the executive branch, he would have. And if he could have gotten us all to get the shot tonight, he would have, but his powers have been limited. And I ask that as you go in that you will continue to just support the, and make these bills that will defend our body autonomy. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emily. Next, we have uh, Mercy. And then we have Wendy Roy and then uh, Anna Hicks. Thank you guys so much for allowing us to be here and for being here yourself. I can't imagine that it's very easy to represent Brevard County, even in Florida, because we are uh, a feisty bunch. So thank you for that. I am with the Florida Freedom Keepers, but I hope to bring a unique perspective. I am twice vaccine injured, and I want to tell you about it from a military perspective. My first vaccine injury occurred in the Army in 2004 when I was given the then experimental HPV vaccine, which sent me into rapid unnatural menopause at age 21. I can't even begin to tell you all the ways that that destroyed my life. But every step of the way, I have been incentivized to claim that my symptoms were psychosomatic. I have even had VA doctors tell me that I should go claim military sexual trauma so that I could be compensated that way. But I have too much integrity for that. Um, my second vaccine injury occurred toward the end of nursing school when we were asked to receive the H1N1 vaccine. This vaccine was pulled off the market for way fewer adverse reactions than what we are seeing now. It was that education that allowed me to see how the gap between research science, also known as pure science and applied science, uh, this gap between that and applied science is intentionally maintained by corporate bureaucrats. Earlier this year, Senator Marco Rubio testified that China has utilized capitalism against us, deputizing major U.S. companies to push for policies that help China. A Medscape article entitled COVID Arts May Not Be So Different After All provides evidence that this infiltration has extended to health care. The same system that is willing to go to unfathomable lengths to make sure that every single one of us is vaccinated and to hide our vaccine injuries is the system that is going to be issuing medical exemptions if we let that happen. That is not protection. It's called the fox guarding the hen house. 
So um, I just also want to ask that there is a lot of legislation being put up that is doing things for our veterans that is actually pushing us to disability. I have tried so hard to be a functioning member of this society and I am being incentivized to go get, to become 100% disabled. If I become 100% disabled, they will wipe away $55,000 of student debt. If I become 100% disabled, I can smoke all the marijuana I want. If I become 100% disabled, it goes on and on and on. Even uh, t t uh, property taxes they're talking about reducing. And I've been fighting for 15 years and I feel like giving up. I feel like going ahead and just being a useless member of society. So I won't tell you which legislation to push, but when you are there, I ask that you would consider helping veterans to become functioning members of society instead of being pushed into disability. Uh, the way that the medical system creates lifelong patients. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mercy, and um, that's uh, it's an interesting take on that because as much as we want to help our veterans, sometimes you're right. We're we're pushing them into an independency of the government, and, and not only be called disabling. right, not only the veterans, but we're also pushing a lot of our citizens into a, a dependency on the federal government, and that is exactly what the federal government want. That is not a Republican stands. We want them to be independent, not dependent on that. that. So thank reassuring. you. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Wendy Roy. Hi. So I'm very green up here. I have first time up, so I appreciate your patience. Um, I'm Wendy Roy. I'm here to represent myself and also other people. Uh, that have similar disabilities to myself. It's kind of hard to follow her and talk about it. But actually, we had no legal represent or no real legal representation under the law during all these mandates that kept coming and coming. The the I'm just going to read off of here. I'm so just nervous. Just read it. So no, thank just you. read it. You got time. Uh, with the pandemic of epic proportions, there has been pressure upon everyone in this room to support and come in line with strategies decided by lawmakers such as yourself. So I'm thankful that you are here today to listen to us. I can only imagine the pressure you have been under, and I have a lot of empathy for you and your family. However, my empathy also. Uh, doesn't stop there. It goes to other people in the room, including myself, who have been affected by this. And just as I know you like to protect your privacy, I too like to protect mine. So this is really important, so I'm going to disclose something, that um, I have a disability that makes it extremely difficult for me to wear a mask. Of course, I'm going to cry. So during this pandemic, it was extremely difficult for me. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I actually had back surgery and had no mask on in the hospital, no mask on the doctors, all the physical therapy. I did not have to wear it until those mandates came in. Then businesses had to come under the mandates. And all of you think about it, going into stores, would they allow anybody in without a mask? It was difficult. I couldn't even come to a place like this and speak. So what I'm asking you, and I'm going to read back from here, so you all have the power to protect all Floridians, including those with disabilities. Mine, you can't tell. You cannot tell. It's invisible, but there are people. And within this county, I believe there's 15% of the population has, has um, disabilities. Statewide, it's over 13%. So there's a bunch of us. And we do not, we want to have employment. We want to be able to go to the doctors. We want to live as, as if we don't have disabilities, like she says. So help us. And I thank you for being here. And I got through that, so I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Wendy. You did a, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna Hicks. Good evening. Good um, evening. This is the first time I've done this in a long time for another county. Um, at 40, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and experienced allergic reactions to topical chemicals 
used in the medical and dental field, latex bandages, shower caps, fire ants, and insect bites. At 71, I've never taken a shingles, flu, or pneumonia vaccine. No one can predict my internal response when injected with ingredients that Dr. Fauci says can cause an anaphylactic reaction. The CDC's Vaccine Adverse Event Report of 9-3-2021 has 5,783 cases reported, yet none are discussed on mass media or social media. I am not anti-vax. What people put into their body should never be dictated, just advised by doctors, and should never be mandated by any form of government. Does the phrase, my body, my choice, only justify an abortion? Shouldn't it be every decision concerning my body? By the way, last night I learned Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the definition of a child is an unborn or recently born person. I thought that was kind of interesting because you'd never hear that. Um, as our elected representatives of individuals in Brevard County, you must respect our choice for the freedom of choice. Thank you all so much, and thank you for what you're doing, and I love Florida. Great. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you. thank you for those comments. Okay. Uh, we, any think, questions? Well, what I was going to say is since they were talking about government, I understand that like Social Security checks might going to be having a problem. I saw that yesterday. I have not heard, but right. we will check into yeah. it. Can we put um, that if, as a note? And yes, and also the fact of, yes, I would love a job, but no mask and no vaccine. Thank you. Great. Um, and we have our contact information. Uh, okay, William. Um, William? Are you here? Okay. William, if he shows up, we'll talk to him. Uh, Christina Baker? Christine Baker? Okay, Christine is not here. William wanted to talk about the second, but protect the second Bavard County. Um, he was under number tab um, 45 and constitutional carry. Then we have Christina Baker, which is tab 46. She wanted to talk about health and human, unjust and unconstitutional mandates on COVID. Uh, and then we have 47, Matt Collins, Florida Gun Rights. Matt, are you here? He is tab 47 members. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Collins, and I am the Director of Legislation for Florida Gun Rights. I represent the hundreds of thousands of members in Florida and millions of gun owners also in Florida. Our primary objective in the 2022 legislative session is the advancement of constitutional carry. Constitutional carry is simply defined as the ability for law-abiding citizens to be able to carry a firearm without first obtaining a government permit. If you're legal to possess, you're legal to carry. Constitutional carry is the law in 21 states now, including five states just this year that have passed it. Uh, Representative Sroy uh, co-sponsored the legislation last year, so I know where he stands. So my question is, with a simple yes or no of all of you, do you support or do you oppose constitutional carry? I don't think that's really uh, the quorum for us to do that. Uh, listen, I support the Constitution, and mm -hmm. I support constitutional carry. That is one of the things that we will probably be looking at this session because it, it is yes, important. You, you we, did say you support constitutional carry? Yes, I do. Oh, awesome. Uh, uh, sir? Yeah. I don't want to yeah. put anybody else on the spot. That's that's their choice, but that's not what this delegation meeting is about. Yes, it's not to put members on right. the spot. It's well, to I, I listen think to the what citizens, citizens and constituents say. deserve to know how their legislators stand. And I would call them personally one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Robert. Thank you. I'm really glad all those people came in and talked about voting integrity. I have a suggestion that I'm offering to the state. Over 50% of the ballots cast in Florida were absentee ballots. And we know there are people who would like to see a lot more absentee ballots because of ballot harvesting. Florida has enacted some great voter ID laws, but we know those laws are currently under attack at the federal level. And as you said, the federal law trumps state law. But there is a method of identification that can't be considered racist and has no economic barrier. And that is a fingerprint. Everyone can provide fingerprints and fingerprints are considered a non-testimonial act, which means the state can request them if it wants to. In lieu of an ID, a voter would simply have to present a thumbprint. 
Each absentee ballot can contain a special pad that will allow the inkless capture of a thumbprint. Ballots will be set up in the standard format and will enable the precincts to scan this information and send it to a centralized voter information center for processing and verification. These limited voter information centers could be set up to be as transparent as possible, allow access for people to see the verification. The benefits of a non-real-time system for fingerprinting is the cost and schedule for implementation is greatly reduced. And, while we're, and it also reduces the cost for each precinct since they no longer have to do the verification on their own. By eliminating the barrier of not having a photo ID, we can increase the integrity of our elections for all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next, we have Barbara. Is Barbara here? She represents the Heritage Isle Republican Club, and Barbara was going to speak also on the medication uh, without penalty and government intervention of parents and guardian in charge of their children. So, uh, Barbara, I'm sorry that you weren't able um, to make it. The next one is Michelle Beavers. Michelle? Uh, I'm Tabitha Cree. I'm the next one. Can we switch places? Sure, absolutely. So there's not much I can add to all the different reasons for freedom for health decisions. It's been stated extremely well. Um, I really appreciate all the effort that you guys are putting in, and I appreciate the fact that you recognize the devastation it's bringing to all the different families, these mandates. Um, one of the things I do want to bring up is an overlooked outcome. I am an engineer. I worked at Northrop Grumman for five years. Because of that, I have connections at all the other DOD contractors. I've been heavily involved in their staffing um, and involved in their different projects. Recently, I hosted a company party at my house, and one of the topics that came up was, what are they going to do once this mandate comes out? Because a lot of them will not be getting it. Entire programs are going to be in jeopardy with major defense outcomes. The skill sets I had were particularly strong in STEM. And I know some of the other programs that are going to have major gaps that are going to be hard and take years to fill. What you can do now to protect them is, is put different things, making those companies liable or protecting people now just to hold it up in courts to give this chance. Madam Chair, right now, can I make a motion? Yes. Can I make a motion uh, to uh, allow the meeting to go to 715, please? Uh, yes, that uh, with no object, without objection, show that motion granted. Thank you, Senator Wright, for paying attention. And it's Tampatha. I'm sorry, you're Tampatha, right? Tabitha. Okay, she's under tab one. We started over again. No so we're on tab one in the back of the book, in the back. And she switched places. Um, with Michelle Beavers. Michelle was kind enough to let her go next because she has, you have a baby, right? I do, I okay. do. Okay, go ahead, continue. All right, so... Um, one of the big impacts we're going to have is a lack of continuous training between skill sets. Uh, people are choosing to retire early instead of get this vaccine. One thing that a lot of the general population doesn't know is there is a bimodal age gap in our engineering field across all of defense. Many people are very young and green, and many people are very close to, to retirement, and there is not much between. We are about to lose a massive chunk of that retirement. The most vaccine hesitant toward COVID is our PhD level people who are the people we need to keep on these programs and we are going to lose them. Um, huge chunks are not telling their coworker or their, their employer that they're planning on leaving. I have listened to multiple conversations about this. Anything you can do to delay this doesn't just help all of these families. It helps our, our country stay safe. Um, so please take that to heart and, and um, realize the importance of that. Right now, th this, this fight's on you. I mean, there's not, we're going to be voting out anybody we possibly can. I know more people who are interested in politics that have never been interested. They'd rather work on their math equations. There will be door to door campaigns like never before. The sleeping giant actually is awake. It's kind of started with Trump as in people paid attention to politics. It's wide open now. Um, so please don't, don't give up on this fight. There are so many people rooting for you guys. That's it. Thank you to uh, Tampa and uh, and you are correct. And what is is um, it's the 
again, I go back and I hate to keep going back to the federal government. We are fighting them with the, with the uh, Northam Grumman, with the Harris corporations, all of these federal governments. Um, the, the federal government has come down and said that your contracts will be uh, removed if you don't do it. Now, that's but the fight that we have to try to if take they up. they can't fulfill the contract because they don't have the talent? Absolutely. I agree 100%. And, and it's not only that the, the engineers that may retire, you, we can't, you can't find enough engineers, new engineers, to even hire. So right. it's going to be a double whammy if that happens. So, and, and, and so the general population knows you can't just throw an engineer in. No. It takes, it takes over, it took me over a year to get my clearance. Um, it takes a long time. Right. It's not a small thing. Right. Well, we're going to continue to do what we can to, to, to protect the businesses here in the state of Florida, as Governor DeSantis has done in the past. So we're it. working on it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, Michelle, thank you for... Uh, that's my daughter. I figured it was. <laughs> yeah. I saw you holding a awesome. grandbaby. Yeah. Uh, her husband's an engineer. My son is also an engineer. And they're not taking the vaccine. So they are, have already, already planned their way out, what they're going to do. Um, we're also looking at leaving the state because we're not going to stay here if our one draw was this community, um, the, the, the engineering jobs that we have. If those high paying jobs aren't here for them, then we can go somewhere else where dollars go more. So that's, that's what we're looking at. I had a whole speech written. I've thrown it out now. So let me just start with um, the, the, va the, the, so medical freedom just doesn't, it doesn't stop at just the, Mac, the, uh, sh the shot mandate. My husband was sick with COVID, really sick. He had several comorbidities. And my doctor said, please do not go to the hospital. Let me try to treat you at home because he's, a, my doctor said, they'll kill you there because they'll give you rem, 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 or whatever. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so he, um, uh, he was able, my husband was able to get um, ivermectin. Within 24 hours, he turned around. Incredible, incredible um, from what he was. Um, we, we monitored at home. He was very, very ill. Um, but with listening to his doctor and taking um, that and some other medications, he did great. Doctors are afraid, in case you guys don't know, to prescribe ivermectin. They're actually afraid. That shouldn't happen in Florida. That shouldn't be, that, that's part of that medical freedom. Our doctors should be able to say, you need ivermectin, and here it is. So we're, 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 we're giving away our rights to these people. It's not just the, the, the vaccination, it's our doctors being able to prescribe and treat us the way we wanna be treated. So um, it was all about medical freedom. I appreciate your time. I hope that you guys listen. I hope that you go forward and you do the right thing because history is full of people who didn't do the right thing and the, the bad guys have always been on the side of making people do what they don't want to do and you're the good guys so great thank, thank you. you very thank you very much michelle uh members we had a, a carol cork who sent in but she said she just sent in a request not speaking uh it's on health and human services uh so i'm assuming that it also has to do with the uh, uh mass mandate and vaccination mandates um, now we'll go to the citizens that did fill out. Uh, Diane, um, sure. yes, you're next. And then Daniel Nye, Robert Burns, and uh, Joanne Benford, or Benford. If you guys would get in line and be ready. Uh, Ready, set, go. Hi, I'm Dana Schomer. I'm from Merritt Island, and um, I'm really, really concerned about voter integrity. And I had a sheet sent up for all of you. This was a, a, what the, it was a finding summary table from the Maricopa County, Arizona um, voting audit. And just to cite a couple examples, mail-in ballots voted from a prior address. 23,344. Potential voters that voted in multiple counties, 10,342. More ballots returned by voters than received, okay, 9,041. Official results does not match who voted, 3,432. In total, this list is 54,000 votes. Trump lost Maricopa County by 10,000 votes. Now they're looking at auditing four other counties in Arizona. Texas is gonna audit four counties. I think that 
in light of the fact that Zuckerberg gave those $860,000 grants to four of the counties here in Florida to buy voting equipment and voting tabulators, I know you know that it came with strings attached. We need to have an audit of the machines and the equipment that were bought in those four counties. We need to know that they're not connected to the internet when the voting is happening. There was more to this. There were overwritten scripts that deleted votes. And then there were votes that were supposed to be kept for 22 months that weren't kept because they didn't keep the records. It was like the stream coming in, it was first, first in, first out. So when it got full, the ones that were in first were pushed out. Um, anyway, you need to get some checks going here because if nobody's vote matters anymore, then we, there's no point in even having elections. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Daniel Nye. Thank you, Chair and Delegation. Uh, I'm with Central Florida Cares Health System. And we want to thank you on behalf of the 8,132 citizens from Brevard County you helped last year. Central Florida Cares is one of seven managing entities in the state of Florida. What we do is we provide support and services to, to make sure there's contracts for services. And we actually work with 30 providers within the counties of Brevard, Orange, Seminole, and Osceola. Last year, within our network, we were able to positively impact thousands of individual lives through services such as care coordination, children's mobile response teams, opioid medication, assistive treatment programs, peer recovery support services, just to name a few. The way we look at the th services we provide is we're putting individuals back into society in a productive manner versus having them back in a more intensive environment, which is gonna cost the system more money. So as we look at this next budget year, we look at you to continue to support the initiatives for SAMHSA Health, Behavioral Health, and Substance Abuse. We thank you. Great, thank you, Daniel. Representative Altman. Well, thank you for what you do, and thank you for being here. I understand there was an effort a couple of years ago, we're trying to get some information about it, that one of these emergency response units, mm -hmm. we, we were wanting to put one in Melbourne. Yes. There's a need. I'd love to get, if you have information. Oh, yes, my definitely. My legislative assistant, she'll raise her hand real, real quick. CRT. Okay. If you can get her that information. Oh, yeah. CRT. CRT. Yeah, because yes. that's actually working very well in a couple of neighboring counties. And, and I know they're wanting to put one in Melbourne. I know. Yes. If you could get with Riley okay. for now, I'd love to. All right, work thank, with you. You thank we you. Have, uh, we have five minutes left. So Robert Burns, did Robert... Robert, are you still here? Okay, Robert has left. Uh, we have Joanne Benford. Joanne, are you still here? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you all for your service and hearing us share our concerns today. Today, I wanted to ask you to please repeal the red flag laws. There is no evidence red flag laws reduce violence. Red flag laws deny due process and seizure of property, remove and deny the accused the right to face their accuser, and are considered guilty until proven innocent. Red flag laws violate our amendments, the first, the second, the fourth, the fifth, the seventh, and the fourteenth. Please repeal the red flag laws. And that's all I have for you today. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I think that brings us to the end of our meeting, and uh, I'd like to give, uh, we have five minutes, so I'd like to give each, each of our delegation members a minute to, um, <laughs> to, um, to have closing comments if you choose to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to let everyone know that, and a lot of you have left, I've been rather quiet this evening. Most everything that you've said, I've written down on every page. I got writer's cramp. The things you're talking about, we're already doing. We are already working with the new Surgeon General to get what you're talking about. I'm fully aware of the wrong drug and the right drug. I've looked at all the studies, but I if I would have done that, we'd be here till tomorrow morning. Tyler and I are gonna work on the red flag law. We already are planning on doing that. There's all the things that you're talking about. I'm an, I'm an NRA member, life member, 
So I believe in some of the things that we've talked about. I also already have appointments with Dana Young to talk about Film Florida, because I'm 100% behind doing films here in Florida. And you talked about that earlier. So I just want you to know, even though I've been rather quiet, I've been listening to everything you said. I'm believing in almost everything that you said, and I'm here to support you. So I appreciate you not going home thinking that guy never said anything, because I have been listening. And, and, and um, I've been asked by Webster Barnaby to join him on his, his bill that mirrors Texas, and we're considering doing that. The reason we can't just say something like, yes, I'm for it or not, until we see the whole bill. There might be something in there that you don't like or that we don't like. So that's why we're a little bit mute until we see all the, the bills. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you, Senator Ryan. And that's a good point when we say that we support an issue. We, we may support an issue, but when the bill's written, there's things in that bill that we do not support. And I am a strong believer if there's anything in a bill I do not like, I will not vote for. So that is something that I think we all should take into consideration whenever we are um, looking at bills. Uh, Representative Saroy. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Just wanted to thank you for uh, you and your staff for hosting us tonight and getting the meeting organized. Wanted to thank our audience for coming out as well and our sheriff's deputies uh, for keeping us all safe. Thank you very much Great. for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I yes. want to also thank you. Packets were remarkably well done. And I am amazed. I've never been to a delegation meeting where so many people stayed to the end. It just This is a special group here tonight. Yeah. It yeah. is. And um, I'd like to, again, thank my staff. They worked hard in putting this binder together. Thank you guys for all your hard work. Um, and, you know, again, you guys have been an excellent, excellent speakers. Um, you know, usually these delegation meetings can get out of control, uh, but uh, this one, there's a lot of emotion. Uh, there's a lot of issues that we all care about, and I think everyone conducted themselves in a, in a manner that you should be very proud of yourself. Uh, you know, one of the things in that Representative Tyler and I, uh, Representative Roy and I went to earlier was Blue Mass, and, and I will tell you, uh, and this was at St. John's, correct? Right down, the right down the street, and that is an annual mass that they hold um, praying for our first for our first responders and our law enforcement one and I would encourage you next year I think I was told it's going to be on September 29th uh, next year um, I would encourage uh, everyone that cares about our law enforcement to attend that mass it was it was re really moving um, and very much appreciated um, thank you guys for coming out our offices are always open I think I speak on that on behalf of all of our delegation and uh, we do look forward to seeing seeing you in Tallahassee this year since we will be open uh, for constituents to come in so we do look forward to seeing you there and with that um, Senator Wright moves that we adjourn and without objection we are adjourned the opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.